We're pulling back the curtain to show you how toxic churches use NDAs to silence victims and to cover up the mistreatment of people. And that's what today's episode of the podcast is all about. In this final installment of our docu-series on NDA use in the church, we're going to lift the veil and show you the truth all about things like how real churches have used NDAs to keep people quiet and the massive damage that they cause. We're also going to expose some well-known pastors who were caught blatantly lying about the use of NDAs in their church. And we'll even hear from a real world group of church elders about how they justify their use of NDAs. And as they admit that they have little to no power to hold their pastors and church leaders accountable or make a change. But we won't stop there. We're also gonna look at some brave and courageous people who have started standing up against the use of NDAs in churches and for truth in their own communities. We're also going to break down real NDAs that churches have used to show you how they work and to show you how they try to hide some of the things that are in them and how insidious they actually are when you understand them and you know what to look for. And finally, we're going to finish this docu-series by talking about and sharing some practical ways that you can stand for truth and against NDAs in the church right where you're at. Because the truth is, together, we can stop the use of NDAs and we can stop leadership abuses in the church. But it's going to take all of us. It's going to take many of us together. We can't do it alone. It's going to take me and you taking a stand right where we're at to get where we want to be. It's going to take us all to make it a reality. So let's dive into part three of the Secrets Churches Keep together. All right, so let's start this episode by calling NDAs what they are. Let's call a spade a spade. NDAs are nothing short of gag orders and hush money designed to keep people quiet and silent about abuse, questionable actions, and legitimate concerns that should be checked out. That's all they are. And the truth is, they have zero place in the church. Sadly, as we've seen so far, they've actually become the norm in churches. And many more churches than most of us would ever dream are actually using these NDAs. They're seeping their toxicity farther and farther into the church every year that we let them go on being used behind the scenes silently and without our notice. So today we're going to bring it all out into the open. And the best way I know how to do that is we're going to look at some real use cases of NDAs. We're going to look at the damage that NDAs have caused in churches like Hillsong Church. We're going to look at other churches who have been known to use NDAs and the lies they tell, the narratives that they spin to try to make people think that what they're doing is not using NDAs and to try to make people think that what they're doing is on the up and up and it's not that bad. We're going to actually look at these NDAs and we're going to see the things that churches hide as well, how they tuck some of these NDAs in there where they may not seem like such a big deal on the surface, but they have massive repercussions and they're going to keep people quiet for a lifetime or longer in some cases about things in the church, sin in the church, abuses in the church that need to be dealt with. So let's start by looking at one of the most well-known churches in the West, Hillsong Church, and their use of NDAs, how they've used NDAs, why they've used NDAs, and some of the repercussions that have come from it. And we're actually going to look together at multiple clips from the recent documentary that Vanity Fair did called The Secrets of Hillsong. We're going to link that in the description so you can check that out on your own if you would like. But we're going to look at some of these clips. We're going to hear 
about some of the things that Vanity Fair uncovered about the use of NDAs at Hillsong, see what we can learn from them, and then we're going to move on and continue to look at some other churches, but let's start right now with Hillsong. In this first clip, we're going to hear one of the primary reporters on this project discuss why it's so hard to find out the truth about what's going on at Hillsong and why it's been so hard for decades to report on them. And guess what? NDAs are going to be a part of why that's so difficult. I think it's incredibly hard to report on Hillsong for a number of reasons. The church is not transparent in any way. It's run by a board of directors that was ostensibly handpicked by Brian Houston. They don't communicate with the press. And the church forces a lot of people to sign non-disclosure agreements. You know, if you say bad things about Hillsong, Hillsong can then pursue litigation against you. So that scares a lot of people off. So you heard there from Alex French of Vanity Fair talking about, again, why it's so difficult to report on Hillsong. He said they're just simply not transparent. And in addition to not being transparent, they have a board that was handpicked by Brian Houston. They have a board that is going to do all they can to protect the people who started in power to stay in power. But he tells us one of the biggest tools they use to keep from being transparent, to keep from having to talk about the truth, to keep us in the dark, is the use of NDAs. They make a lot of people, volunteers, staff members, and the like, sign NDAs, and they have this threat that comes with them. If you say anything bad about Hillsong, something bad is going to happen to you. So what's the result? Very few people have wanted to talk about anything that's went on at Hillsong. And it's just been in the last couple of years that enough people have started talking to reporters where many of the scandals and the things that have happened there have actually come out. There was a lot going on that was hidden that didn't need to be hidden. And now it's all coming out at one time. Yet there are still untold numbers of people who were held back by NDAs, who were scared to talk and won't talk. But finally, enough people stepped forward outside of those NDAs, and they had enough anonymous sources that Vanity Fair could do this series. And if you haven't seen The Secrets of Hillsong, I highly recommend it. I think it was well done. But let's continue and look at another clip together. And in this clip, we're actually going to hear him talk more about NDAs, hush money, and this lack of transparency at Hillsong. So let's listen in that as a board, uh, we have had to deal with. The first incident involved us O'Brien text messaging with a female member of staff along the line of, if I was with you, I'd like to give you a kiss and a cuddle or a hug, words of that nature. Uh, that particular staff member was obviously um, upset by that. The text messages Brian had been sending led the woman to resign from her job. This particular staff member came back because she couldn't get work. Hillsong leaders set up a meeting with her and they asked her what she wanted to sort of make all this go away. And she said that she just wanted to be paid the salary she had lost since she had resigned. And they said instead, how about $25,000 and a confidentiality agreement? All right, so the first allegation we hear about is a former staff member at Hillsong who brought allegations against the pastor at the time, Brian Houston, that he was sending inappropriate text messages that basically added up to sexual harassment. They were inappropriate, and not only did she bring allegations, she brought evidence. Now, this whole ordeal... Uh, it. it <clears throat> Now, this whole ordeal led to her resigning from her job, and that makes total sense. It would be really hard to work at a place like that. Now, my guess is the way that they handled it or really didn't handle it and tried to sweep it under the rug probably played a role in her resigning. And all she asked for was that they would cover the uh, amount of salary that she lost as she looked for another job because the, the dirty little secret that a lot of people won't tell you when you leave a big church like Hillsong, a lot of times you get blacklisted, blackballed, and it is hard to find another job in ministry. It can take a little while. So she's asking that they help cover the salary that she is losing 
while she's losing, while she's looking for another job after this whole ordeal. And instead they immediately ask her, Hey, what if we give you this big severance payment, this big hush money payment more than you're asking for, but we attach it to a confidentiality agreement so you can keep your mouth shut and you don't talk about it. And that's sadly all too normal, but it's not over yet. Let's continue. That secret was kept for 10 years inside the organization and known apparently to only two people. Personally, I uh, was not aware of that, as was the majority of uh, the global board. Spool forward to 2019, there's Brian's 40 minutes inside the hotel room of a woman who was a supporter of Hillsong. Brian said to be drunk. Brian said not to have had his key to his room. Found himself knocking on her door, found himself inside there. Brian has said there was no sexual activity, but he was in the room for 40 minutes. He doesn't have much of a recollection because of, he says, the mixture of the anxiety tablets and the alcohol. The woman complained, oh, what did they do? They returned her donation and her conference fees, the minimum possible. Again, Pastor Brian, with remorse, said, I don't want the church to have to pay that. I would personally pay that. These allegations were treated very seriously. Um, and I believe, you know, real significant steps were taken to investigate and resolve them. All right. So the second allegation that they're discussing here is a woman who had former pastor of Hillsong, Brian Houston, stumble into her hotel room at a Hillsong conference, and he stayed there for 40 minutes. It wasn't like he just walked into the hotel room and left. He stayed in her hotel room for 40 minutes. She brings this allegation, feels very uncomfortable that he's trying to force himself on her, and all he can do is make excuses that, that it wasn't his fault. He did it on accident because of a mixture of alcohol and anxiety medication, which first of all, when you have a pastor whose excuse for his inappropriate behavior is a mixture of alcohol and anxiety meds, I think we got a whole separate issue there. But then again, they did their best to simply make this go away. But in this case, they felt like they could get by and keep her quiet with one of these agreements without a big payment. So, they want to give the least amount of money they can. And I've seen this, guys, in tons and tons of churches. You may have one NDA that's tied to hundreds of thousands of dollars to keep someone quiet. And in another NDA, if they think they can keep them quiet for $2,000, they'll keep them quiet for $2,000. And in this case, they felt like if they just reimbursed her the fees from the conference, they reimbursed her everything that it cost her, that that would be enough. And here again, you have another allegation that was kept secret for years. I believe, you know, real significant steps were taken to investigate and resolve them. Again, we have this, this same old pattern. We have an investigation team appointed. The investigation team is meant to be independent. When you look more closely, you find out that three of the four are old mates of Brian. And so we have a Hillsong curated version of those events. The women involved had no voice. And here we see another one of the negative features of NDAs in the church. We have someone sign an NDA, we keep them quiet, and then just to make people feel better, we do an internal investigation. Here's the problem with most of these investigations. The people, the board members, the staff members inside of these churches that do the internal investigation, they have no idea how to do one of these investigations, and their livelihoods, their success, their comfort is tied to exonerating the person, the leader in question at their church. And most churches, once they use these NDAs, they'll do an internal investigation instead of an independent investigation. Now, when you do an independent investigation, that's where a church says, we want to know the truth, even if it's uncomfortable. We want to make sure that we protect people and that we are above reproach. So we're going to bring in some people from outside. That could be uh, another organization, it could be mediators, it could be an HR firm, it could be a law firm, but we're going to bring in some people from the outside to investigate these allegations, to investigate what happened, and to make recommendations to us as far as what we should do. 
When you do that with an impartial third party, you can get to the truth. And if your pastor or your church leader is exonerated, fantastic. You know you can trust that. But when you don't do that, when you do an internal investigation, here's the bottom line. An internal investigation in a church should never be trusted because it's people who don't know how to investigate it, who have a stake, a personal stake in just making it go away. And because that happened, it left these women, it left these victims with no voice and with really no protection for future potential victims. Nothing really changed at all until we get to this point where it starts coming out publicly. The decision was made to offer, I suppose, what I would call grace um, and not to cover up, but to not expose. So there you hear Phil Dooley, who actually took over for Brian Houston when he finally was removed. He's kind of the chairman of the board here. And after all of those allegations, he said the decision that we made, and of course, most people, even on the board, aren't hearing about these allegations for the first time until now. So the decisions a couple of people made without talking to the board about it was to show grace while they said dealing with it. And, and that is really all that means is they showed grace and didn't deal with it at all, other than to make people sign NDAs and try to make it go away. No real steps were taken. They don't actually tell us that any real steps were taken to stop this kind of behavior that's now been repeated twice that we know of. The source told me that they and others were determined this time that Hillsong would not control the narrative. And that's why they wanted to leak the entire audio of the meeting to me. And I would hope that, you know, I don't know if people are recording this, I, I would hope not. <laughs> Within five minutes of that meeting finished, I had a file and was able to write a report, which I got out in about 30 minutes. All right, so this is the first time that these particular allegations have been talked to with the whole board. But the only people who are on this Zoom call are board members. Yet these board members knew that Hillsong had such a pattern of trying to spin the narrative and trying to control the narrative and trying to spin these stories in order to protect themselves and to protect Brian Houston that literally somebody on that board we don't know who it is, but someone on that board was so fed up with them hiding the truth and spinning these stories that they leaked this recording within five minutes of the meeting ending. And because somebody was brave enough to leak this recording, we finally started knowing. We finally started understanding and learning about these NDAs, these cover-ups. And of course, when they came out, more and more and more kept coming out, and it became a snowball effect. And that's what happens with NDAs. When someone is finally courageous enough to actually step up, not sign the NDA, share a recording, do something like that, when someone finally shares the truth, very quickly you have other people who will find courage to share the truth. But until that first person actually starts sharing the truth, it is really hard for anybody to do it. And until a handful of people do it, it is still very, very difficult. So we need to, to do everything that we can to protect these truth tellers, these courageous people at all costs. Because without courageous whistleblowers like this, we'll continue to have abuse and scandals that are hidden in the church and sin that's not dealt with. And I'm so grateful that there were finally some people who had courage to share this recording and get it out about Hillsong. It was the day the Houston lost Hillsong. It was also the day Hillsong lost control of the narrative. All right, that's massive. I don't know if you heard that, but that is absolutely huge. The reporter said that that day when that recording was leaked, that was the day that Pastor Brian Houston lost Hillsong. But more importantly, that happened because it was the day that Hillsong finally lost control of the narrative. And I can tell you, Hillsong's not alone in this. I know of many churches, many churches who have controlled this narrative for so long that they're okay until the day there's a crack in the foundation. Once there's one chink in the armor and one person comes forward, then it's all going to start crumbling because the only reason why these churches are thought of the way that they are, the only reason why they're growing and still standing is because of how many times they've been able to hide the truth 
and twist the narrative. But the moment we start demanding truth from these churches, many are going to be okay, but some really big, well-known churches are going to crumble overnight because they've been hiding sin for that long. But if we actually knew the sin they were already hiding, we wouldn't want to support them anyway. All right, in this next clip, we're actually going to hear about one of the first NDAs to ever make its way into Hillsong's orbit. But I want to give you a warning. This may trigger some. This is uh, this is a little bit more graphic. This is an NDA that was handwritten on a napkin by Frank Houston, Brian Houston's father, to try to cover up a very specific instance of sexual abuse. So again, if this uh, triggers you in any way whatsoever, or you fear it may, go ahead and just skip forward. But you're going to see how dirty these things are, but they've come a long way. So take a look at what happened with this handwritten napkin. And then when we review today's NDAs, the type of NDAs that are being used by churches today, you're going to see just how far we've come from a food stained napkin. But let's look at this first one. And again, prepare yourselves. This is a little bit hard to watch. At least it's hard for me to watch. I eventually agreed to meet Pastor Frank on or about early 2000. The meeting was held at McDonald's restaurant at Thornley, just up the Pennant Hills Road. And what did Pastor Frank want from you um, during that meeting? He wanted me to forgive him. You were asked to sign a food stained napkin, is that right? Yes. Words were said to the following effect, if you put your signature there, I'll give you the 10,000. And at that stage, sir, I just want to tell you that I was in a state of panic. I just scribbled my name on it and Frank kept badgering me about the forgiveness. All right, so the person you hear talking was actually sharing this with the Australian Royal Commission, who was at the time looking into child sexual abuse by religious institutions. And this is a person who had been abused by Frank Houston as a child. Frank Houston meets with him as an adult, as these things are starting to come out, as he's scared that this is going to be made public, and he slides over a food-stained napkin with an offer of $10,000 if he'll forgive him and not talk about it. If you won't talk about the abuse you went through, I'll give you $10,000. Scribbled on a napkin decades ago. Talk about a hush money payment. That right there is it. And that is, in a nutshell, everything that's wrong with an NDA. Now, we put them on stationery now. We put them uh, in, in nice legal language. But they're still as dirty as that food-stained napkin. And every single time, they're covering up something that should be in the light. And you know what? I get a little sick every time I watch that clip. But that's how sick we should get every time we hear about a church using NDAs. We got to stop making excuses for these churches. If a church uses an NDA, they are no better in my mind than Frank Houston sliding over that first food stained napkin. But that one isolated incident, that wouldn't be the last we hear about NDAs because we've already heard it became standard practice, standard operating procedure at Hillsong after that. But sadly, you're going to see in these cultures, it's not just the NDAs that keep people quiet. It's also pressure from people inside of the church who often would rather see victims of abuse stay quiet to protect people in ministry and people in power than to get justice and protection for the least of these. Let's go ahead. Listen to this next clip together was only on or about 1978 when I was about 16 years old that I told my mother about the abuse. My mother was still heavily involved in the church at that time. All of her friends were involved in the church and the Houstons were considered to be almost like royalty in those circles. After I told her about the abuse, my mother said words to the following effect. You don't want to be responsible for turning people from the church and sending them to hell. Wow. This person waits until they're an adult to finally tell their mother about the abuse. They finally say something. This was before they were held to this NDA. Yet the first person they reported to, their very own mother, said, You know what? You don't want to be responsible for turning people away from the church and sending them to hell, do you? So, hey, why don't we keep this quiet? so that we can protect the church and we can protect our pastors. Now, I wish that I could tell you that that doesn't happen often. I wish I could tell you that this was just one dark situation. But in all honesty, I've seen this happen. 
I've heard these same phrases used time and time and time again. Heck, they were even used with me when I refused to sign an NDA. They were used with me and my wife when we first started talking about some things that we had seen that were sinful going on in our church. And we still hear them today from internet strangers about what we're doing with Church Disrupted. There's probably not a week that goes by that someone asks us to be quiet in order to protect the church and keep people from going to hell. So it's not just these NDAs that are keeping us quiet, but it's the fact that we have such a huge amount of cognitive dissonance when we find out that people in the church, leaders in the church are mistreating people, that we often choose to protect abusers in the church rather than to protect people who need it. And we have got to get to a point, Christ followers, we got to get to a point to where we care about justice and love more than we care about protecting people in power and protecting how our churches look. Because all it's doing is hurting people. And I can promise you this, Jesus doesn't want any part of that. Jesus had some pretty stern warnings for people who did that. So we've got to stop this crap. We've got to stop these narratives that when you tell the truth about leaders in the church mistreating people, that you're hurting the church. You're not hurting the church. You're protecting it from wolves in sheep's clothing who have snuck their way into the sheep pen and are hurting God's people and hurting the church. We've got to tell the truth because it's the only way to protect people. Sadly, though, that's not the only time that would happen. That actually became a normal occurrence around Hillsong's orbit, just like it's become a sad and toxic normal occurrence in the evangelical church in the West today. Let's listen to this next clip, and you're actually going to see this goes much farther than the one incident. One of the things that I came across that I really wasn't expecting to was just how much conservative evangelicals emphasized authority. You show your obedience to God by being faithful and submissive to people that God has placed in charge of you. They set people up for abusive leadership. And when I listen to the voices of survivors, members of their own communities, their own churches, sometimes even their own families, questioned their stories in order to continue to protect the ministry. So here you have a religious historian who studies churches all over the West, and she says this is a common occurrence that churches draw and, and are almost a magnet to narcissistic and abusive leaders because of the way that we so often teach that you don't come against your leaders, you don't question your leaders, you protect and honor your leaders. And I have heard leaders teach this honor culture, push this honor culture, and I have watched people inside of church after church after church protect these abusive leaders because they think they're doing something good for God. But all that does is keep these abusers in leadership, and it keeps the cycle of abuse, sin, and mistreatment going. Every time we hide these things to try to protect the church, all we end up doing is giving the church a bigger black eye instead. We got to tell the truth, because the best way to protect the church and to protect people is to be honest about what's going on. Here's the problem, though. It's really hard to be honest about the things that you see and the sin that's in the church when there is no accountability and no safety net for leaders. If churches don't have systems to hold the pastors and the leaders accountable, then it doesn't matter what you say or who you say it to. And I've run into this in my own life. I've run into, hey, how do we report these things to elder boards and other church leaders who end up sweeping them under the rug anyway? But again, we're going to see, this is a problem that was at Hillsong, but it's also a much broader problem in the Western evangelical church world. Frank Houston practiced an oppressive style of leadership. He shamed people. He humiliated them. But it's not only Frank, because Brian Houston, he goes out on his own and he starts his own congregation up. What he does is really mimic the leadership structure that Frank had installed at his own church. There's really interesting parallels there. All the power of the church centers on its leader. Frank Houston had no one that would stop him or question him. I can't see that in Hillsong either. The accountabilities, the safety nets, they seemed absent in both. There were church elders in the centers of God, 
and they had degrees of influence themselves. But Frank Houston didn't want that. Instead of voting for board members, he took that apart and basically said, I'm going to handpick the board members. I am the leader. So both Frank and Brian Houston, Brian Houston at Hillsong, they set up churches to where no one could really hold them accountable at all. Again, their boards were handpicked. They could remove people from the boards whenever they wanted. All of the systems were created that you had this one leader, this one leader who would call all the shots. And again, I wish I could tell you that that only happened at Hillsong, but I've seen it with my own two eyes at churches that I've been at as well as other churches, but especially churches that I've been at, I've seen it the same way where no one or at least very few people could hold the pastor and the key church leaders accountable in any way. Because if the people who are supposed to hold you accountable are handpicked by you, then you're never going to be held accountable. And if there is no accountability, if there is no safety net, then there's no one who you can safely report to when you see sin happening in the church, when you see abuse happening in the church. So in addition to these NDAs, one of the reasons why these cover-ups keep happening, why these scandals keep happening, is because we don't have good accountability structures. It's also one of the reasons why NDAs keep happening. Because if the people know about the NDAs, they can't actually hold anybody accountable to stop using them. And you're going to hear that from a real elder board in just a little bit later on in this episode. But sadly, most of them don't even know their NDAs until someone finally reports it. And then they just tell them, hey, you need to hush and we can't do anything about this. So because there's no accountability and you have one or two people who hold all the power, that's why we have NDAs. That's why we have cover-ups. And either you protect the person in power or you lose your power, your standing, and your livelihood instead. If you don't protect them and if you don't protect the golden goose, the chosen one at the top, then you might just lose everything at the hands of a church that feels spurned, at an angry church that will do whatever it takes to keep you quiet. Doesn't sound like the church, does it? Well, it doesn't and it shouldn't, but that's the truth. That's literally what way too many of our churches are doing today and it cannot continue. And with this final clip we're going to look together at with Hillsong, you're actually going to see what I think is the biggest reason behind how they got here. Because you may be asking the question, I know I have, how in the world the churches get to this place? Because I've never met a pastor who got into ministry and said, you know what? I want to mistreat people. I want to abuse people. I want to get power. That's not why most pastors get into ministry. But a lot of these pastors tend to get twisted, tend to get turned. So how do churches like Hillsong get here? How do so many churches get to a point of NDAs and hush money and cover-ups, and covering up sin, and doing all of these things that we talked about. Well, it happens for, I think, one big reason. It's a heart reason, it, and it starts in the heart. You're going to see it in this clip. Listen to this quote, and then we'll talk about exactly where these things come from and what the root of this mistreatment of people actually is. When I started our church, I have to confess, I saw crowds. I didn't see individuals. We have a lot to answer for to answer for. That's what causes this most of the time. When we start seeing numbers instead of people, when we start seeing people as money and people as success and people as a means to an end instead of the end, right? When we start seeing that and we don't see people the way that Jesus saw them anymore, it will always end up leading to things like NDAs and hush money because it's all about our success. It's all about growing the church. It's all about growing our brand. It's all about how we look and the money we make and all of those things. Yet it's impossible to be about those things and impossible to think an NDA is a good idea when what you care about most are people. Caring for God's people, sharing the gospel, and loving people the way that Jesus loved them. When people are front and center, NDAs can never take root. So if you find out that a church is using NDAs. When you find a church that's using NDAs, you found a church that's lost sight of people and lost sight of the reason God gave them for calling them to ministry in the first place. All right, but let's move on from Hillsong. Hillsong's a great example of NDAs and a silencing, abusive culture. But I want to look at a more recent example. 
Pastor Albert Tate, we've already talked about him in uh, the first couple of episodes. If you haven't checked those episodes, you can check them out. I encourage you to go ahead and follow up and get caught up. But Albert Tate is the lead pastor of Monrovia Fellowship Church. Fellowship Church Monrovia, he's one of the darlings of big events like the Global Leadership Summit. He's a very well-known pastor in evangelical Christianity and Recently, he's actually been embroiled in a scandal very similar to the ones that the board was talking about with Brian Houston earlier. It started with inappropriate text messages to a woman who wasn't his wife. We don't know much more about it than that because the church has tried to keep it so hush-hush and so quiet. They actually didn't let the staff know that there were any of these allegations for six months after they came in and the board had started working a restoration plan with Albert Tate. So think about that. The board of this church starts trying to restore the pastor before the staff even knows that there was any inappropriate or sinful behavior. But what I want to do is I want us to listen in to a recent town hall, because once it came out that there was inappropriate to the staff, uh, the board actually had a meeting to talk to the staff about this. And in that meeting, the staff shared with them that there were a lot more allegations. There were, there were allegations of abuse of power, of sexual misconduct, of sexual harassment, all kinds of other allegations came up when they finally talked to the staff. They've been dealing with the fallout for months now. And the videos that we're going to watch, we're going to hear recent clips from a town hall meeting where Pastor Tate and a couple of board members were holding this town hall meeting, talking to parishioners, trying to control the narrative, trying to smooth over what happened, trying to smooth over the fact that over 31 staff members have left because of this. And in this town hall meeting, as they try to smooth everything over, we're actually going to see not only how Monrovia Fellowship views NDAs, not only how Albert Tate views NDAs, but we're going to catch them in some lies. We're going to catch them in some bold-faced lies as they try to twist the truth, as they try to control the narrative, and they try to spin what they've been doing. They're going to try to spin it and tell the church they didn't use NDAs when they're one of the most glaring examples of exactly what we're talking about. The documents they've used are exactly what the lawyers have told us NDAs look like, especially Boz Savijan earlier on in episode one. So let's listen to this together. Let's listen to how these pastors and board members try to spin this story. I'd like to know if there were any non-disclosure agreements executed. Right. So, yeah, yeah. Oh, no. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, were there any non-disclosure agreements? As far as they're talking about the severance agreements, do we? No, I want to make people sign any, NDAs. Yes. Yeah. Were there any NDAs signed in fellowship with anybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Oh, so, okay. No, 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 no. I'm saying yes, answer the question. Oh, 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 yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> They could ask a very simple question. Do you use NDAs? And if you don't, the answer is super simple. No, we don't use NDAs at all. Okay. But instead, do you see this dance that Albert Tate and one of his board members actually do? They're trying to coach each other. They're trying. Albert Tate is trying to silently let him know what to say. And he fumbles this in a really heavy way. You're actually going to see Albert Tate try to come to his rescue when he doesn't spin the story well here in just a moment. And often that's what happens because pastors like this, and again, Albert Tate's a great example. This is a handpicked board. This board is, as far as I understand, voted on by the church. This board doesn't even come from the church. It's filled with people outside of the church, like absentee landlords. And they're coming in trying to deal with things, sin that's happening in the church. They don't even know what's going on in the church. So when you actually ask hard questions of leaders in these churches, Nobody knows how to answer them except for the pastor. And many times, because the pastor is not used to having to answer hard questions, they'll make mistakes. Just like you're going to see Albert Tate make some huge mistakes here because he's not used to having to ask, answer questions under fire. No, so, so it, 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 what it is is you have, you have confidentiality agreements. Correct. My question is, were there any? Yes, he's a we have severance agreements 
and it's a non-disparaging clause in that agreement that we have offered to everyone that has left that we paid a severance to. It's our, it's been our heart, which is, which is not enforceable by the way. So the comment has come up several times about such money. Well, first of all, if there was hush money, ain't nobody hushed. <laughs> and, we ain't, and, we, and you will not see us applying or asking anyone not to say anything. So you can check with anyone that's done. It is our practice when we are able and when we can to be as generous as possible to the people that have worked here. So what Albert Tate says is he says, no, we don't use NDAs. These aren't NDAs. They're just severance agreements, which, by the way, you're going to remember we heard in episode one that severance agreements by Savigian said severance agreements is one of the names these non-disclosure agreements go by. Most non-disclosure agreements are not called non-disclosure agreements, right? They're called things like severance agreements. And Boz also talked about non-disparagement agreements and non-disparagement clauses. We've heard from multiple lawyers in this series multiple attorneys who have said a non-disparagement clause by itself is an NDA. And when Albert Tate says, you know what, it's not even enforceable. Well, the truth is it's an enforceable contract. The reason why he says it's not enforceable though, that part's true. That's where he's spinning. He knows that those broad reaching NDAs would be struck down by a court. So if they try to take someone to court, here's what's going to happen. First of all, they're going to look terrible. Because we don't think about this. We let churches bully us into signing things like NDAs. Most churches don't actually want to take you to court because it is a PR nightmare for them to take someone to court over breaking an NDA with abuse allegations or with sin allegations. But beyond that, if they were willing to deal with the PR nightmare that is taking someone to court, most of these agreements would be struck down, at least in part, by a judge because they're so broad and because they're, they're, they're just trying to keep people completely silenced for lifetimes. So we've heard from attorneys who said, when you try to make these agreements too broad and too silencing and they're unfair, the consideration that is giving for like a lifetime of silence, they're not going to hold up in court. So these churches know, one, it's going to make us look bad if we take people to court. Two, a judge is going to throw out at least part of the NDA, if not the entire NDA. So why do they use them? Because they know that most people will never call their bluff. And the fear that we'll take you to court and take you for everything that you own is enough to keep people quiet. And let's be real. If a church did decide to take you to court, even if you won, even if it ended up getting struck down, most of these churches have huge legal budgets and they can outlast a common person who can't afford to keep an attorney on retainer for that long. So they keep people silent out of fear until a lot of people come forward about NDAs, a lot of staff members leave. And then when enough people start asking questions, the whole facade crumbles and they can't take everybody to court who's talking about them right now. They can't take everybody to court who leaks an NDA. They can't take every staff member to court. And in the place that Monrovia Fellowship's in, they're struggling financially because of all these scandals. So now they don't have the resources to keep people silent. They don't have the legal resources to fight this in court. So even though Albert Tate says it's not enforceable, yes, that is true, but only because of how bad these NDAs are. They are absolutely Toxic. So I just have a question because mm -hmm. I do not assume that any NDAs were signed. Knowing that NDAs were signed and executed, my question is the people that signed the NDAs were under your authority. You were in power, you're still in power. You have a platform. People that signed the NDAs have no platform. Whether they are currently being employed, or being let go or let resignated, how would they be able to have a voice to express their reasons for departure or any complaints that they may have against someone in authority? What platform do they have to be able to speak with people that are still in fellowship? That's my question. Thank you. All right, so I think this person does a great job. They set an incredible example for us of how to ask tough questions. So after all of that spin and after all of those lies to try to make people in the room believe they don't use NDAs, 
This person totally ignores all that and says, no, no, I'm smart enough to know that you use NDAs. And instead, here's what they say. Now that I know you've used NDAs, I didn't want to assume, but now that I know you've used NDAs, let me ask this question. And her whole question is around really abuse of power. Because if the people who are in power over you or who ask you to sign an NDA, then the person without power doesn't have a platform to speak up about the abuses and sin that they've seen. That's what she's asking about. And uh, of course, Albert Tate's about to answer. But you can even notice if you go back and watch that video clip, you have the board member on the right who the whole time is just basically making fun of her. And he's saying, well, you could have shared it on Instagram. You could have shared it on Facebook because other people have already shared those things. But what this person asking the question is getting at is, okay, well, if the dam didn't break and if brave, courageous people didn't break those NDAs and say to hell with those NDAs, I'm going to tell the truth because that's what God wants. If they hadn't have done that, where would a person normally go to share the truth or to have a platform to share their concerns or legitimate complaints if an NDA was used? They're not going to give this answer, but the real answer is if they're following that NDA, there's nowhere for them to go because not only was it abuse what happened before, but the NDA itself is a form of power abuse because there is a power imbalance between the one giving the NDA and the one signing the NDA in most cases. I just want to clarify that because a lot of people ask questions about that. So they're not NDAs, number one. They're not NDAs. They're non-disparaging clauses, among other things, and it's a mutual agreement that we would not sow discord in the body. A non-disparagement clause by itself is an NDA. It doesn't even hold as much weight as in our handbook, the confidentiality commitment that we make. So when you work here, you are committed to confidentiality uh, with, with people in information. This has to be a sacred place. It has to be a place where confidentiality is held high. The language in the confidentiality handbook, which everyone that works here is required to hold, is more strict than what's in the non-disparaging agreement. It's more strict because it goes way beyond protecting the legitimate things he's talking about, which we've already talked about, and there are legitimate uses for that. But the confidentiality clause and agreement in the employee handbook is another form of an NDA. And as you're going to see when we break down one of these employee handbooks a little bit later, they're just as broad. They're not just protecting the right things. They're keeping people silent about everything that happens in that church. So no one is invited to leave fellowship with this muzzle on them. They are not muted. What we are inviting is a mutual respect for one another because, and if you have an awe with someone at fellowship, I would argue that we practice Matthew 18 and go to them, yeah. even though that this is not corporate, it's a power, and power. We are pastors and shepherds. You can come and what the scripture says, if you come and you feel like you're not heard, Go and grab another, grab an elder, grab someone from y'all. And y'all come and say, hey, we're coming as a congregation and coming with them. We have a problem. And if that doesn't work, Matthew 18 says, then let's, let's take it out. Let's take it out. So he says no one leaves Monrovia Fellowship with a muzzle on. But I would dare to venture a guess that most of the people who have been given those NDAs feel like they were sent out of Monrovia Fellowship with a muzzle on. He also talks about Matthew 18, but I can tell you from my experience, here's what generally happens. You do feel like from the moment you're given that NDA, that if you sign it, you have a muzzle on. And if you don't, it's because you don't understand it. Because when you look at it closer, you realize you can't say a thing. But most of these churches, they talk about Matthew 18, but when someone actually tries to go through the Matthew 18 process with them, it doesn't work. In mine and my wife's experience, we went detailed through the Matthew 18 process for months and got nowhere. No legitimate investigation was done. Nothing was listened to. And the pastor in question that we were trying to correct, we were trying to have a conversation with, was insulated and protected from so much as a conversation with us the whole time. And Matthew 18 cannot happen if the two people with the issue can't have a conversation. But that's not just my experience. That actually happened, as you're going to see a little bit later, with Monrovia Fellowship. Their staff members presented concerns. When they weren't listened to, they sent a letter from the staff to the elders and to the members of 
the church. And when they sent that letter, you're actually going to see, instead of the letter being received, instead of people having actual conversations about how we can fix this, more staff were just let go, and the people in staff who had a voice were terminated. But we'll get back to that in a minute. But it's just important to know, and one of the main ways that churches like this spend their use of NDAs is they'll use things like Matthew 18. But try it. The moment someone comes to them with Matthew 18, they don't want to hear it. Not to mention, if you sign the NDA, take it to a lawyer. Look at it. An attorney will tell you in NDAs like this, if you sign the NDA, you signed away your right to Matthew 18. You signed away your right to do what the Bible says because the NDA, with those broad non-disparagement agreements, says you can't do anything that would embarrass the church. So if you try Matthew 18 and it doesn't work, you can't take it out because you signed that agreement. And that's why the only time we generally hear about these things is when someone who didn't sign the agreement finally stands up or someone breaks the agreement. But Albert Tate's not done. He's going to continue spinning this thing. And the more he tries to spin to save face, he just digs himself a hole that he can't get out of. So, so if, if that's, I don't know who that is saying we did, but please grab a group of us and let's come and let's, let's reason together. There's a big difference between you hearing what you want or hearing something you disagree with. And if you're asking, is there a platform for people to promote their disagreement? The concern with that is that you're not going to bring all the, it's like, it's like you go to work, you have a fight with your boss, you disagree with the conclusion, you go on Facebook with your clients and hash it out there. At some point, we just got to have a good faith and say, if there was a court process and you brought something and you didn't feel heard, bring somebody else with you and come so that you might be heard. We desire to hear you. But at some point, we've got to all be willing to tell the truth together and say, I didn't like what I heard. I don't like the direction we're going. I disagree with it. So now I want to leave. That's respectful. That's honoring. And I'm not mad at that. That's not what we're talking about. Y'all, we have not practiced abuse with our staff. We have not. It has been a frustrating place. Some answers were disagreed with. Some answers, you're right, came way too late. But we are not monsters and abusive. You were just frustrated and you didn't like it. And that happens at work. But what, what should not happen is it goes into the congregation and it sows discord among one another. Now we're fighting with one another because we're not getting the whole truth. We're a church family, but we also have an HR department. I can't sit down and tell you everything that went on in the conversation. So when you hear something different, you call me a liar, and I'm saying, I got it. we got records, but they're not, everyone has to own their contribution to where we are. Yeah. I'm owning mine. This is what I contributed. We all have to hold our contribution. Yeah. And that's not going to spread well on Facebook and, and Instagram. And that, kids, is blame shifting and victim shaming at its finest. Albert Tate takes a page right out of the narcissistic abusive leaders playbook. All right. People are asking legitimate questions. He doesn't have answers. So what he says is, you know what? If you hear this from somebody, I don't know who you're hearing it from, but if you hear that we have NDAs, uh, go ahead and just come with them to us and we'll talk about it, you know, but at some point we're going to have to move on. And uh, some of y'all can't move on just because you got your feelings hurt right? And he basically said, some of y'all got your feelings hurt at work and you couldn't move on. And he starts pointing his finger and getting angry. And he makes the people who talk about them having NDAs and people who have brought concerns, legitimate concerns, he makes them the villain. And he starts wagging his finger and he starts yelling about it. They're the villain because they made a big deal out of nothing and they didn't follow Matthew 18 and this and that and the other. They can't move on. It's their fault. He says, I owned my portion of it, which I actually don't think he did, but now you got to own yours. That tone, that is blame shifting. It's really their fault, not mine. And that is victim shaming. He makes them look like the bad guys. When at the end of the day, 
No, Albert, they're not the bad guys. You and your board decided to use NDAs that and pay hush money. And no matter how many times you say it wasn't hush money and you say it wasn't muzzling them to silence, that's not true, according to the attorneys that we've already heard. So no, they're not the ones that are having the issue. They brought an allegation of sin against you and then an allegation of sin against you and the way you responded to that allegation of sin and your response was to try to make them look like a villain. No, when pastors do things like that, they're not qualified for ministry and quite honestly, they're cowards, okay? And when you actually call a narcissistic leader like that on their bluff, and you don't let those cowards get by with it, they will crumble because their egos are so very, very fragile. This right here, what you're seeing from Albert Tate, you're seeing a caged and scared animal just trying to survive. When you know what? I actually think the best way for him to survive in ministry would be to own it and to say, you know what? I made mistakes. I did things that were inappropriate. I was, you know, uh, practicing abusive leadership and I don't want to do that anymore. And I'm so sorry. We should have never used NDAs. We're going to stop doing that. I think he would have a better chance at making it telling the truth and showing humility and repentance than this whole song and dance he's doing right now, trying to make the people who brought the issues forward and brought the truth to light look like the villains. This is ridiculous. And I'm sorry, you may be watching this and going, Jeff, why are you so angry? I wish you weren't so angry. I apologize. I hate it that I get this angry over this. But there is a righteous indignation that I can't help but feeling when I see crap like this. This is spiritual abuse. Watch the way he handled all of those questions. Watch the way he turned it around. That is a perfect example of spiritual abuse. And even though I wish I wasn't so angry about it, the truth is Christians in the kingdom, we need more Christians who are going to get a righteous indignation about sin like this being hidden in the church. And we need more people who are going to get a righteous indignation about pastors attempting to spin the truth to protect themselves and protect their sin and protect their livelihoods. This stuff has got to stop. Most of the pastors I know are way better than this. But guys like this, situations like this, are making the entire church look bad, and it's got to stop. Now, after that embarrassing exchange, you would think Albert Tate would want to just get out of the meeting, that he would want to stop trying to spin and answer these questions. But no, he's going to double down. He's about to actually answer a question about hush money. You're going to hear how he talks about that a little further. And again, he just keeps digging this Whole, because the more he tries to spin, the less it makes sense. Thanks, Julie Ross. I am a journalist. You are. Most of the stuff you printed has not been true. Well, we'll see. No, obviously, I know. But the things that you said about me are not true, man. Not true. Okay. You've printed things and you've been told things that are not true. I'm not to speak, but I'm going to ask you My mouth, my name been up for a long time. Give me a second. Hey. Come on. Come on. Yo, Come on. Julie, Come on. welcome to Fellowship. Welcome to Monrovia. Peach Cafe is the bottom. You should check it out before you leave. But give me, give me your questions. Well, first of all, maybe you could just tell me specifically something that was incorrect in the article. Sexual harassment was incorrect. That was reported that that was in the letter that came from staff. Exactly. Most of the thing that was in the letter from staff was incorrect. Okay. So that was not me. I was reporting. The you letter. report incorrect information. You put your name on it and you reported it. Yeah. I reported it and I interviewed it. Exactly. When you say it, like, I'm sorry? That's what reporting is. But anyway, let me ask my question. All right. So she asked, could you tell me what was untrue? Uh, she actually says later as well that she asked for um, a statement from Monrovia Fellowship before she actually published any of the articles and they continued to turn her down because they weren't interested in talking to her. But she reported about a staff letter. We're actually going to show you the letter that the staff sent the elders um, and that the staff sent to specific church members soon. Um, but she reported that there was a staff letter that was sent and she reported on the allegations included in that letter. Okay. There was nothing incorrect about that. That letter did go out. We've got proof, and we're going to show you here in just a little bit. What Albert Tate took exception with was he said, no, the allegations in the letter weren't true. That's not how reporting works, though. Julie didn't report that the allegations were true. She reported that there was a letter from staff members with those allegations. But again, Albert Tate throws a temper tantrum and, and just keeps interrupting her, keeps speaking over her, and trying to make her look bad because he doesn't want 
anybody talking about what's going on. He doesn't want anybody telling any story that doesn't align with their narrative because that's what narcissistic, abusive leaders do. And these are the types of leaders who are behind these NDAs. At all costs, they'll do what they can to protect themselves, to protect their livelihood. What's their question? What's their question, Julie? So the NDAs, an NDA is not disparaging. Plus, that's what an NDA is. That's right. Julie calls his bluff right there. You said you didn't have NDAs. You had non-disparagement clauses. By the way, Albert, a non-disparagement clause is an NDA. Way to go, Julie. The people that were let go, um, were they given six-figure NDAs, some of them? Ooh. So, the, so the huge thing is confidentiality. Right. So you so you want me to talk about everybody? You want me to talk about people's salaries and numbers and math like that? In this room? That's inappropriate. Well, I have documentation that's been given me Ooh. showing that some of them did receive six-figure NDAs. So I'm just wondering if that's not hush money. One, and, and these are employees that resigned, and I do have a, a document here from your your own. Your own, um, sorry, I can't think of the name. The, it's interesting the handbook, has this. the employee handbook, it says separation from employment. Employees of Fellowship Church are employed on an at-will basis. This means that employment may be terminated by either party at any time, with or without cause or notice. And then it has a note here. It says it's important to note that no company provides severance packages for individuals who resign. Severance is only possible in situations that includes personnel layoffs. Now, the people that I see, at least one of them, uh, and maybe more, I'll have to go through this whole document. I just got it recently. Oh, um, who gave it to you? Yes. Who, you, who gave it to you? In full transparency. Since we're being transparent. <laughs> Confidentiality. Yeah. 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 Documents all the time. Okay. Yeah. But, but that's unfortunate. So, so. But, the, but the, the question is, somebody got a six-figure severance, according to this, unless you tell me this is wrong, according to the documentation I got, that a six-figure severance and this person resigned. This person was not fired. And according to your own, you're saying there's no misappropriation of funds. Right. Yet according to your own handbook, you say you don't give severance, you don't give to anyone who resigns, and yet you yeah. gave a six-figure severance yeah. to somebody who resigned. Can you explain that? This is what the church family, I appreciate you being here. I will respond to your statement, okay. but I don't want to give you any more time tonight. If you want to... Wow. Because because you're a journalist and this is not a gathering for a journalist. You request for the you request church and you never respond. I know because I'm not interested in talking to a journalist. I want to talk to my church family. And it's not that he's not interested in talking to a journalist and he just wants to talk to his church family. He's actually not interested in having to tell the truth or deal with hard questions, but I digress. So friends, church family, if you remember what I said earlier, I'm so I'm so sorry. Are you gonna answer my question? No. Yes sir. I'm, I'm so sorry for the confusion and the hostility. Uh, and we, so can I have a No, no, no. I'm, I'm going to respond. I'm going to respond, but I'm not about to go back with you, man. Thank you. Thank you for, for being here, but I'm not interested in commenting to a journalist. Fellowship Church family. It's what I said earlier. Uh oh. Watch out. Albert Tate's putting on the pastor move. He's got up. He's standing above you. He's going to change his voice. He's going to change his inflection, and he's going to change the way he talks to you. Now, instead of talking about all those big, bad people who are doing the wrong things, Fellowship Church family, from the very beginning, we wanted to tell you, I'm so sorry that you're having to go think about the way he's talking. This is all manipulation. Okay, I could say this. I've been in pastoral ministry for a long time. The moment he stands up and changes his, vo his vocal inflection, this is manipulation. Not only that, but it's a psychological power play that even though he seems like he's coming across softer, he's now standing up, coming out and standing over them to remind everybody who really has authority here. Okay. That may seem like a small thing. And some of you may disagree with me on that and say, Hey Jeff, you're just nitpicking, but no, I know how this works. Him standing up, changing the vocal inflection is a hundred percent manipulation to try to wrestle back control of this situation because he's losing control. He's losing the narrative. So he's doing everything he can shut Julie up, turn on the pastor voice, the pastor mode and see if I can win the room back. What I talked about earlier, we love our, we love our, we love our staff. We've always loved our staff. And from the beginning, 
when we had staff transition off, whether they resigned or were laid off, it has been our practice to try to be a blessing to them. All right, so two things he says there that I think are really, really important. We love our staff. We love our staff. Let's see when you see the letter from the staff. If you read that letter, it doesn't seem like they felt loved. But also he says from the beginning, when someone's transitioned off staff, that's a really hard time. We wanted to be a blessing to them. And I agree with that. Transitioning off a church staff is extremely difficult. But giving them a blessing, trying to bless them, it's not a blessing when it's tied to a legal document that demands your silence. When you have strings attached like that, it's hush money, not a blessing. We've done that when we've been able to do it as much as possible. Transitioning off is a devastating thing. Some of you are giving money right now to help with that devastation. That's been our heart to do that with every transition. So even if you resign at fellowship, there are several, when we're able, that says, we still want to bless you. And that has been our tradition from the beginning. So those severance agreements and those gifts weren't isolated to only people that do this or no. No, it went to, went to as many people as we could to our own peril. So how do you spend giving multiple six-figure severances, multiple six-figure hush money payments to people to keep them quiet when you're hemorrhaging financially as an organization? How do you, how do you spend that? You know what? We want to bless people so much that we've blessed them to our own peril. You didn't bless them to your own peril. You did your best to keep them quiet, and now you're pissed because it's not working. $100,000 plus severance payments are not a blessing. That is hush money, especially when you look at the non-disparagement clauses that he's already confirmed because he thinks, guys, pastors like this, he confirmed they use non-disparagement clauses because he thinks the people listening are too stupid and too dumb to know that that is an NDA, okay? They they think they can get by with anything. So now he spun this, trying to get control of the room, doesn't let Julie talk, puts on his pastor voice and says, no, these things were just blessings. By the way, did you notice he never answered yes or no to giving the six-figure severances because he knows he did. He can't say no, and if he says yes, it's going to be harder to spend this than if he just starts talking about wanting to bless people. This is ridiculous, but if you don't know what to look for, we'll let charismatic leaders like this totally twist it and make us believe them. When you know what to look for, you see them for what they are. More often than not, liars who are just trying to protect themselves because they've been cornered with the All truth. All right, in this last clip that we're going to hear from Albert Tate and the Monrovia Fellowship Town Hall meeting, you're going to hear from a parishioner who, from my understanding, is also a Bible professor at Azusa Pacific University. But you're going to hear from a parishioner who asked very nicely, I think in a very honoring way, for an independent investigation. And you're going to watch as they spurn the call for an independent investigation and why they do it. Again, it's, it's a lot of blame shifting. It's a lot of look over here why we do this. Because when you don't have anything to hide in a situation like this, you want an independent investigation. Because when you don't have anything to hide, an independent investigation clears you and clears your name. The only time church leaders like this generally don't want an independent investigation is when they have something to hide. So let's go ahead and listen to his response to this parishioner. Sir, I'm Mike Trump. Um, oh, yeah, I saw you. Yeah. <laughs> I think you know, all of us here are here for the truth. Um, but to have truth, you have to have trust. And at this point, no, not any one party or any one group, trust has been broken. I think we all can agree that trust has been broken. And when we hear things like the board has investigated the situation, you have concluded that there was no fault, there is no trust in that result anymore. Not, I'm not discrediting the investigation, I'm not discrediting the, the value and effort that was put in, I'm not discrediting the genuineness of that. But because trust is broken, the results cannot be trusted, whether it or not. So here's my question. Will the board 
and Pastor Albert be open to an independent investigation of all the allegations, not just of your situation, but everything that's been, all the allegations out there, whether it's financial mismanagement, whether it's uh, related to personnel, whether it's related to maybe even board negligence. Uh, so, so that's my question is, uh, as a congregant, I think we deserve the right to have a non-biased party summon a result that we can trust. Because at this point, we cannot trust the people that have been in charge. Okay. All right, so he asked this. Again, I think he did it in a super honoring way, not trying to throw stones, not trying to assign guilt, and multiple times, including there at the end, you hear the room erupt into clapping. People are clapping because they say, yes, trust has been broken. Yes, we would like an independent investigation, um, but they want no part in an independent investigation. Let's go ahead and listen to the response. There are, um, there's a very simple answer to this, but let me just frame it this way. Do you speak for the entire congregation? No. Yes. Yes. I hear some no's just because the yes is loud. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, my point, hit my point. All right, so the response from this board member, do you speak for everyone? The room erupts in the majority yeses. You hear a few no's loudly, and he says, well, you know what, I hear a few no's. And essentially, he's going to say, unless it's unanimous, and everybody here wants an independent investigation, we're not going to do it. And that's ridiculous. You're never going to find a room where everybody wants an independent investigation. The fact that one or two people say no doesn't mean you shouldn't do an indep independent investigation. Just do what's right instead of using all these excuses. Here's my point. Here's my point. Here's my point, because here, here's my point, y'all. The board, the first slide that he, he gave us was absolutely right on time. Where there's no trust, it doesn't matter if you tell the truth. I can say, I'm Christian Washington. I'm from Compton, California. But if you don't trust me, you might think, well, maybe he's not from Compton. Maybe his name is not Christian. There's a certain, there's a, there's an Ouroboros to this. There's a circular kind of like eating his tail thing going on here. There's not a circular thing going on with the actual allegations. There's a lot of circling going on in their response. That's called spin, as you try to spin it, Christian. And what I'm saying is that in this, in this forum, at this point, we're not going to commit to that. But we can say, look, look at Cape and Cross. Do you trust them on the financial side? Can we trust them if we disclose those things? Can you trust the auditors? Do we not trust them? So he just says, hey... Basically, Cademan's Cross is an auditing firm, a financial auditing firm. We've talked about those and talked about how much stuff is still hidden on those in our video on Miracle Offerings. You can go ahead and check that out if you want to find out more about those audits and why we can't just trust those. But instead of saying, well, get an independent investigation or here's why you should trust us, he says, oh, can't you trust the people that audited us? All the audits do is say that you weren't doing anything illegal with the money. It doesn't say what you were using it for and that you weren't using it for hush money payments, which sadly are legal in churches. Do people not trust Lada? No. 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 Wow. Yes. Well, see, that's what I'm saying. We, yeah. I think, I think <laughs> we are not going to answer that question in this setting. Yeah. I appreciate you asking the question. We'll give a response to that. But I do want the church to understand, most of us don't even under, understand that we have a HR department that is credible and that has not, if there is evidence of sin and, and negligence with the board, if there is evidence of sin and negligence with Laura, what, I, what, what we cannot allow is for people who have walked in integrity and have a history of integrity and just because you feel like you don't like something or you've got a piece of information that now their personal and professional integrity is now brought into question. Actually, Albert, we can. Even if someone's walked with integrity in the past, when credible allegations, evidence, and documentation comes forward that yes, people have been asked to sign NDAs to keep them quiet, NDAs that would be illegal in the business world, and when documentation has been brought that over six figure severances were paid, that hush money was paid, well then yes, it doesn't matter 
if there are people of integrity who have done integrous things in the past, it doesn't matter that you have an HR department. If those things were happening under your HR department, then yes, they're not above reproach. Things need to be checked out and an investigation needs to be done. Because if this was in the business world, those type of NDAs at this point are not supposed to be happening because that's an inappropriate use of HR. So again, that is, um, that's more blame shifting. We can't attack these integrous people just because you misunderstood something. He takes what was wrong instead of from what they did, and he places it on the people who misunderstood the evidence that they were given. This kind of stuff is ridiculous. We cannot let leaders like this blame shift. We got to stop. Every time they do it, we've got to call it out. We've got to stop it because if we let them get by with it, they will evade and they will dip and they will duck and they will, they, man, they will constantly evade everybody's pursuit for accountability and nothing will stick to them. They're like Teflon. But if you call them to the carpet and make them give you answers, they don't have a good answer because they can't spin it if you make them give clear answers. We have to do what's decent and in order and what's biblical. I love you, Mike. But if I stood up and said, Mike sleeping with three women... Now, now do investigate them. Too, da, da. But everybody in here think now you sleep with it. That's wrong. We can't do that. Yeah, it would be wrong to make a false allegation about someone in the crowd sleeping with three women. It's not long wrong to make credible allegations where evidence is there to support it that you've been making people sign NDAs, that there's been abusive leadership, or at least what people could consider abusive leadership, and that you've been doing six-figure severances. The difference is there's clearly something to hide here, Albert. That is not the same. Stop evading the truth and answer the freaking question. We can't live like that. We can't just throw around an accusation just because you don't like someone, don't feel something. Everyone has to tell the truth. And where there are receipts of lies, where there are inconsistencies, bring, in the name of Jesus, bring them forth. Julie brought receipts today, and he refused to listen to her, refused to look at them refused to give answers. The staff brought receipts. The uh, interim leadership team of the staff brought receipts and they were disbanded and vilified. So no, Albert, again, you're lying. What you're telling people to do, you haven't responded the way you say you're going to respond when they've done it already. No, there are receipts. Check the receipts and give an answer. And let the process, if the process is filed, if, if, if Laura has, has, if her integrity has been compromised, if someone says, I brought it to her and she didn't do, 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 that's a hard word, due diligence, then let's take that into account. But we just can't stand in a room where there have been men and women operating in integrity and you've got reports of inconsistencies, but you don't have any proof. Again, there's proof in the room that he hasn't responded to right now. There's proof in the reports that he's tried to discredit that's actual proof enough for allegations. But did you notice what Albert did there? Albert shifted not just he he shifted the blame off of himself he shifted the narrative from his inappropriate behavior to Lara and HR and all these other people on staff working behind the scenes who have been people of integrity and why are y'all attacking them Albert they're not attacking them. They're asking questions about your behavior, but the more you evade and the more you do this, it's actually showing that other people were in on your behavior. Other people were enabling your behavior. But by making that subtle shift, now it makes it, makes it more difficult for people to continue bringing accusations because now they don't feel like they're bringing those credible accusations against Albert. They're bringing them against all these other people of integrity. Again, that's just another page out of the narcissistic abusive leaders playbook. No. To discredit these people's integrity is not right. Not right. That's not biblical. Not right. So if there's evidence or there are cases or you represent the voice of a staff person and they feel intimidated to speak, please, Come with, come with them and let's reason together, brother. Come, let's reason together and let's sit down and work out things. I think the more information you find, you will see that this has not been malfeasance. It has not been stealing. It's, it's just the way finances go. And when people stop giving, we can't keep paying people. I don't need to hire nobody else to come and tell us that. Caitlin and Krause audits us every year. 
allegations that have come with staff. We have a, a, a HR professional. And if she has, if that's proof of her being, I'm sorry, I need to calm down. By the way, Cademan's Cross the Heaps going back to, um, you can look those up on your own, but there are already reports that are out there of other churches they have audited, other churches they've audited where later after the audits, um, financial misconduct was actually proven. So yes, just having an audit's great, but just having an audit, especially by this company, doesn't mean that there's no financial misconduct because it hasn't meant that in the past. If there's proof of her being unprofessional, then let's deal with those issues. If the board has sinned or done something wrong, let's deal with those issues and let's come reason with it. But if someone is just mad and don't like the direction, then it's not worthy of a full, full on investigation of everybody and to put into question the trust of our professionals. And let's keep, let's keep this conversation going. Come reason together and bring accusation and bring proof and let's process that. But you just can't treat Celine and stuff on, online and confusing the people that call this church home and then, and then rent trust from people. See, that's just more blame shifting, just more blame shifting because Albert, people have tried to reason with you. People have tried to reason with you. There are already plenty of reports online where they tried to reason with you. There was the staff letter where they tried to reason with you. Julie Roy's is in the room with evidence that day that you refused to talk about. So you're asking people to come bring evidence and talk to you, yet you don't want to talk to them. Why? Because Albert is very aware the camera's on and he's not going to give any answers to any evidence with the camera on because then once you do that, you can't spin it. And this is the problem with NDAs. Because of NDAs, most of this stuff never comes to light. But no one in the right mind can watch Albert Tate and this board go through this town hall meeting and say anything other than they're hiding something. There's something going on here. And there is a massive need for an independent investigation. But again, they absolutely said no and refused the independent investigation. So we know, we talked about in episode one, there's a lot of churches that are known to use NDAs. But you've heard today specifically about how Hillsong used NDAs. You've heard about Monrovia Fellowship and how they used NDAs and these huge hush money payments. You've also watched them do the anti-accountability dance. But it's not just these huge, big name churches. Uh, we went through the same thing when we tried to bring accountability around NDAs and other things to the elders at the church that we used to go to, the elders at the church where my wife and I used to work. And I actually, I want to share that. We don't talk about that a lot because we don't want to drag anybody's name through the mud, but this is relevant to this conversation. So, you know, for years we worked at and we attended Faith Promise Church in Knoxville and we loved so many things about the church. We still do love so many people at that church, but we brought fairly credible accusations. We brought very credible concerns to the elder board. And some of those concerns, probably the biggest was centered around NDAs controlling the narrative with hush money payment, right? Because we were essentially excommunicated from the church. We were, you know, basically told not to come back because we refused to sign an NDA. But we recorded a meeting with the elders. This is just an audio recording, but we recorded this meeting with the elders. They knew it was being recorded. And even though they knew it was being recorded, I want you to listen to how they talked about NDAs. I want you to use to, to listen to their excuse, the excuse they use on why they use NDAs right after the NLRB ruling where churches weren't given exemptions yet. They hadn't clarified that churches were given exemptions. So they give excuses why they're still using NDAs that they thought were illegal for them too at the moment. We talk about the legality. We talk about the concerns. I want you to listen to the excuses they give. And man, th there's something else that is very, very concerning to me that they say in this clip. So I, I want you to know this isn't just Hillsong and no accountability. This isn't just Monrovia Fellowship. I, I want you to know this is other churches. Many of you have never heard of Faith Promise Church, yet it's here as well. And it's not just Faith Promise. This happens behind closed doors at so many churches today, but most people will never know. And this is why we're not trying to vilify any church. There are good things that have happened at all of these churches, but I think it's very clear. These are the reasons why we have to get NDAs out of churches and there has to be accountability and a way to call for independent investigations when inappropriate behavior, sin, or abuse of any kind 
is brought up. If there's not accountability and if a parishioner or a staff member cannot call for an independent investigation at any time, then something is wrong. And those churches that refuse to stop using NDAs and refuse independent investigations, in my opinion, I think they should be shut down. But let's listen again to these elders doing what I think is another version of the anti accountability dance. I wanted to address the NDA noticed. Uh, and I brought a, uh, something I downloaded from the internet. This mm-hmm. is a um, statement from the National Association of Ed- 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 And I don't know where that they get in this. But basically, they it says, should churches use NDAs? And then the answer was a year and a half ago. The answer was, it depends. All right, so one of the main concerns that we had brought to them were that the church should not be using NDAs and that many staff members before us had used NDAs and couldn't actually talk about other things that were happening because those NDAs, you just heard this elder, um, this kind of leader chairman of the elder board who said, um, here's our answer to this. Here's something I pulled up from the internet. We'll actually share the article with you in just a moment. It says evangelical leaders are split when it comes to recommending NDAs for employees at churches. Most leaders, 54% said it depends. Uh, 21% said yes, and 25% said no to legally binding confidentiality. Um, you know, just the the smell of it doesn't ever smell good. Mm-hmm. Having said that, you've got, in essence, 70 something percent of pastors and leaders of Christian nonprofits say either yes or there may be times when they may be necessary. So, as elders, we have nothing to do with NDAs. Mm-hmm. You know, what, you're here because of what you're feeling is a Matthew 18 thing. Mm-hmm. NDAs are something handled by the leadership team. That, yeah. You know, have to do with personnel, the HR people. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's something that I would say would be looked at, but it's not in our purview to say sure. what we're going to do with it. All right, so you hear, he says, you know what? Hey, we know NDAs don't look good, but he doesn't really say anything else. They give us this article. They say they know NDAs don't look good. And then from there, he says, it's not as the elders of this church, whose job is to hold the pastor accountable. They said, it's not in our purview. It's not within our power. It's not within our scope to actually talk about NDAs. Yes, if your pastor is knowingly leading a church that is using NDAs, that is paying hush money to people, that is keeping people quiet about legitimate concerns. And by the way, the reason we were meeting with this elder board is because the same pastor refused to meet with us for a Matthew 18 conversation. That's why uh, why he references Matthew 18. We met with them asking not for them to, to remove him or do anything like that. We met with them asking to put together to facilitate a Matthew 18 conversation to talk directly with the pastor about not using these NDAs and specifically about telling the truth, not spinning stories, not trying to hide these sort of things. Yet they say they have no power over that, which means if you have no power to to talk to that pastor about using NDAs and you have no power to talk to that pastor about refusing a, uh, a Matthew 18 conversation with a concerned parishioner and two concerned staff members, former staff members. If you don't have power over that, then you don't have power to do anything. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. If they don't have power to do that, they don't have power to do anything. And that's probably the truth. It is probably the truth. It's how most of these boards are set up. They can really only let people go, let pastors go, if there is evidence of heresy, which is next to impossible to prove in a non-denominational church, or if there's moral failure. And outside of having evidence that there was a, that there was an affair, most of the time they're not going to let go of the pastor then, and sometimes they're not going to let go of the pastor when there's an affair. Why? Because these boards are handpicked. They're not voted on. They're not chosen. They are handpicked by the pastors they're supposed to hold accountable. And just like we heard about in the Vanity Fair clips from the Hillsong documentary about Hillsong, when you handpick a board, there is no accountability. But we continue the conversation about the NDAs because if their job is to hold the pastor accountable, especially for moral reasons, I share with them why we brought this, uh, why we brought the NDAs to them and why I thought 
they should be the only people who could do anything about this. So just you can listen to the rest of this clip and their response. The, the biggest reason why I included that is because, you know, that was from a year and a half ago, um, February of this year, NDAs with broad language, yeah. such as the one that they gave us yeah. around disparagement. It's not around trade secrets, right? It's around not being able to talk to anybody about what happened. Those were actually ruled illegal by the National Labor Board. And that came up in our meeting. Yeah. So what we did there, just to clarify, the uh, article they brought from the National Association of Evangelicals was a year and a half old at that point. And then I referenced uh, the NLRB ruling that was just a month or so old about that point, um, about NDAs being ruled illegal. And here was their response. And I think Matt or Josh or both said they talked to attorneys about that. Mm -hmm. And I'm just playing devil's advocate. Sure. Church's advocate. Anyhow, said that they had asked the church's attorney about it. And they said, it's just so such a new green ruling mm -hmm. that they're really, nobody knew what to do. So, I, yeah, I they've just, been labeled illegal. We're not sure how it'll play out in court right. is, the, is kind right. of the gray area. Um, but I thought it was important to know. And like I said, the church may not know because there's really no HR, like lifelong HR professionals working there. I mean, we get that. Um, but I think it's important to at least know that they have been, you know, that they've been ruled illegal like that. So the, the broad language even though you're not sure what a court will do with it, it really needs to come out because, you know, you never want a church suing something that's, that's illegal. I'm a leadership consultant. That's what I do. I work with churches. I work with businesses. I tell them all, including businesses, non-disclosure agreements when it comes to trade secrets and protecting your investment, that makes sense. Non-disparagement agreements only come out of a place of insecurity and will always hurt you more than they help you. Um, oh, I just, yeah. I'm just sort of laying these sure. out there out of our ballpark. Yeah. Or so. Yeah. Out of our, yeah. our ballpark. And again, the only reason why I put it there was because if something is being done that's illegal, um, that would be something that y'all would want to talk with senior pastors about. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. That's what that. Yeah. All right. So I bring up that these type of agreements were at the time illegal for everyone. That, that exemption for churches hadn't come out yet as far as I knew. Um, but we bring up the illegality of these agreements and they continue to say we can't do anything about it. That's outside of our power. So they're literally saying as the elder board who's supposed to hold this senior pastor accountable for moral failure, they said we can't do anything, even though um, this was illegal. You know, and again, I shared the only reason why we're sharing this with you is because we thought you would want to know if the church was doing something illegal and stop. And again, they did nothing. They said nothing. The only excuse they gave us was, well, our lawyers aren't sure if it's going to hurt us in court yet. So we're just going to keep doing it. And as far as I know, they're still doing it today. I asked them to release people from their NDAs to talk about some of the other concerns that I had, and they refused to release people from their NDA. So as far as I know, they're still continuing to do this, continuing to hide this, um, continuing to pay those hush money payments, and nothing has changed. So again, if you're listening and something's changed, let me know, and uh, I'll go ahead and retract that and let people know um, that you're doing good work. But even here, when faced with the illegality of these agreements, all that elder board could do is say, we can't do anything about it. Which again, if you can't do anything about your pastor allowing something to happen in the church that's illegal, then there's literally no accountability in the church. That's a sham elder board, and there's no point in even having it because no one can actually hold a leader like that accountable. But let's go ahead and take a look at the article that they brought as, as reason for using NDAs from the National Association of Evangelicals. Let's break that down, and you're going to see that the, the case they presented is not actually um, it's, it's not truly what the National Association of Evangelicals wrote about. So let's look at that together. Here's the article. I'm pulling it up. The title, Should Churches Use NDAs? It Depends, in January 5th of 2022. So yes, they did get the title right. They did get the title right. But I want you to hear a couple of quotes from this same article. Let's look at it holistically. But before we do that, let's go ahead and look at the numbers since they broke down the numbers. And you'll remember they said, you know, 70% said yes, or it depends. Let's look at the actual numbers in detail. Most leaders, 54% said it depends. Okay. So a little over half said it depends, not yes, not no, it depends. And I believe that from the article, most of what it depends on is 
Is this to protect databases? Is this to protect giving information, counseling information? Stuff that we've already said is okay, but isn't the issue in most of these NDAs, okay? 21% said yes, only 21% said yes, and 25% said no. So those are the numbers. 21 said yes, 25% said no, and 54% said it depends. But now let's get into some of these quotes. Uh, the National Association of Evangelical President, Walter Kim, said it this way, NDAs are tools that can be helpful to maintain confidential information, but they can also be inappropriately used to conceal information that should be shared, particularly, but not limited to cases of abuse. So literally the NAE president said, hey, yes, these can be used for good reasons, but we gotta be really careful that they're not used to hide information. When they get used to conceal information, a lot of times that's abuse and that's not okay. All right, they continue in the article, evangelical leaders understand this tension. While there may not be consensus on the issues or on the use of non-disclosure agreements, they agree that transparency and accountability are essential within churches and Christian organizations. Yet, you just heard in that meeting with the elders, there was no accountability. There wasn't transparency. Most people at that church did not know that NDAs were used. And for most of my time there, I didn't know NDAs were used. So uh, they also wouldn't release people from NDAs. So there was no transparency or accountability there. And the NAE says that that is key. That whole depends crowd, it is key that we have transparency and accountability if we're going to use these NDAs. Uh, they continue, um, and I love this quote from the article, George Soltero, a practicing lawyer in Tucson, Arizona, added, the bride of Christ should be beyond reproach. Transparency should always be preferred. So basically, not only should the bride of Christ be above reproach, this attorney agrees with what we've been saying the entire time in this docu-series, but he says, when in doubt, transparency should be preferred. When possible, we should choose transparency. And then this last quote, though NDAs are helpful in certain circumstances, these legally bonding contracts have been used to conceal inappropriate actions and even criminal behavior. Many victims of abuse have been afraid to speak out due to fear of legal retribution. An overwhelming majority of evangelical leaders, 93% of evangelical leaders surveyed, believe pre-existing NDAs should be waived when a leader faces credible allegations of abuse. And they don't specify that that's just one type of, of abuse. So that should be leadership abuse, that should be physical abuse, that should be sexual abuse, that should be emotional abuse, that should be any type of abuse. 93% of the evangelical survey, these leaders, 93% said NDA should be released in those situations. Yet in the same conversation, I requested that former staff members be released from that part of their NDA so they could share similar concerns that I have, similar concerns about things going on in the church, and they refused. They used this article as a proof text for why they used NDAs, and either they didn't read the whole article or they just assumed that I wouldn't. Because actually, the majority of that article is saying we got to be real careful if we're going to use NDAs. That it may be okay to use NDAs in certain situations, but we got to be real careful that they don't conceal sin, cover up abuse, take away from transparency and accountability, and that they don't keep people from bringing allegations of abusive leadership. These elders admitted it looked bad. They knew that these had been ruled illegal at the time, yet their only excuse was they had zero power to address it. And it, again, it sounds a lot like Monrovia Fellowship. It sounds a lot like Hillsong, and it sounds a lot like many churches in the evangelical landscape today. So that's the bad news. A lot of churches are using these NDAs and they're running the same anti-accountability playbook they're doing the same anti-accountability dance, but there is good news. And the good news is there are courageous Christians, courageous men and women all over the United States and all over the West who are finally standing up and standing against abuse. They're standing against the concealment of sin. They're standing against the use of NDAs in the church. Christianity Today, in an article, Daniel Silliman wrote it this way, 
a growing number of ministers, missionaries, Christian workers, abuse victims, and victims advocates are publicly objecting to the non-disclosure agreements and confidentiality clauses used by major religious organizations. They say the legal tools that were designed to protect the tech industry trade secrets are widely misused to conceal abuse, preserve secrets, and protect powerful reputations without regard for the human cost. Lee Fernie, who was one of the people that helped start the organization NDA Free that exists just to end NDA use in the church and religious organizations, said this, the moral problem with NDAs is they muzzle a Christian who feels called to tell the truth. So even when pastors like Albert Tate said, no one leaves Monrovia Fellowship with a muzzle on, Lee Fernie said, it's a moral problem with NDAs um, at their core. They actually do muzzle Christians who feel called to tell the truth. Echo Church, that was previously led by Andy Wood, who replaced Rick Warren at Saddleback, and we talked about that in previous episodes, Echo Church has been known to use NDAs for a long time. Yet when Andy Wood was in the succession plan to take over for Rick Warren, there were major concerns about his leadership, potential abusive leadership, and issues in his history. And because staff, especially former staff, wanted that addressed, they actually asked to be released from their NDAs. When they asked to be released from their NDAs, it was refused, and over 1,100 people signed a petition. Over 1,100 people signed a petition asking Echo to release them from their NDA so that they could talk about the concerns that they had, right? And Echo, they refused. They refused. They didn't release them. But think about how brave and how much courage that these former staff members had to have to ask for the release. Think about the bravery of everyone who signed the petition. And it, while it doesn't make sense that so we didn't have a happy ending there, the Echo wouldn't release people from their NDAs, it does give me hope it gives me a ton of hope that people are finally getting the courage to start pushing back on churches that use them. In the case of Albert Tate, we have a lot of staff members, multiple staff members that put together a letter to the board and a letter to the church that said, hey, there are problems how this has been handled. They ask in that letter to do things like replace the board with an interim board while hiring a new board that was actually there and understood the church. They called for an independent investigation. They, they wrote a whole letter where they said, hey, we have to address some of these things. Again, they were spurned. They weren't listened to yet. I'm so glad that there were staff members and former staff members there who were courageous enough to send this letter. And as you heard in the town hall meeting, there were parishioners who were courageous enough to ask questions. There were reporters like Julie Royce who was courageous enough to say, I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't match the evidence in my hand. There are more and more people every day who are standing up and saying NDAs in the church are not okay. And we're going to do all that we can to bring them to an end. And I, you know, even with everything bad that's going on, and even though many of these churches haven't answered well, it encourages me that more people are standing up, but it's not enough. We need more. We need more people like me and you who will stand up and ask questions before a scandal breaks. Let's ask questions before a scandal breaks about our churches and their use of NDAs. And that really does encourage me. But before we finish out today, let's get to the part that many of you have been waiting for. And let's take a look together at a few of these real life NDAs. Now, I'm going to go ahead and tell you, I've seen a lot more NDAs than I can share with you today. Many of the NDAs that have been shared with me, people have shared them anonym anonymously, and they have asked that we do not share them because there is fear that based on the way the NDAs were written, some subtle language changes, there is fear that these churches will be able to track it back to the people who shared them with us. We actually know of some churches, um, and I've even looked at a church where I was presented in an NDA from, where the NDAs change subtly from person to person. So there's a lot of NDAs we can't share with you, but we're going to share a few that we can. And here's what I'll tell you. The NDAs that we can share with you, they are consistent with pretty much all the NDAs that we've seen. When you see these non-disparagement clauses, stuff like that, this is very consistent with most of the NDAs that we've seen in these churches, okay? But again, there are very few of these available. 
Most people will have never seen one, will never see one, but we wanna show you a few so that we can shed light on what's going on. And you can see, we're not just making this stuff up, this is real stuff. So the first two I wanna look at, I wanna look at one NDA that was used at Mars Hill, Mars Hill Church before it shut down when Mark Driscoll was still the pastor. And again, we talked about in episode one, uh, Mars Hill uh, and, and Mark Driscoll, they went through a huge scandal years ago. We're also going to look at uh, an NDA that volunteers are asked to sign at Trinity Church, which is the new church in Arizona that Mark Driscoll pastors today. That's right. If you didn't know that, after all the scandal, after you know thousands of people, tens of thousands of people being left without a church home, he's still in ministry. He's doing it again, and he's still using NDAs. The one we got from Trinity isn't for staff. It's one he makes volunteers sign, which leads us to believe if he's asking volunteers to sign an NDA, that they're also probably still using those NDAs with staff. And there have been rumblings and reports of those as well, although we don't have one of those from Trinity. But let's look at the first one from Mars Hill. All right, so here is the NDA from Mars Hill years ago. And you'll notice at the very top, just like Boz Savijan talked about, it's not called an NDA because that looks bad. It's called a separation and release agreement. And you know, he talked about release agreements earlier on. Um, but it starts out and it, it basically gives all the legalese term. This agreement is set forth between you and us, gives all that. And what does it give? It gives a separation date. Number two right here is severance and other considerations. In addition to the payment of any wages and all sums earned or owed, um, Mars Hill will. And again, this whole section, what it says it's going to give, the severance payment and everything else, that's what Boz called consideration. Unless we're giving you something in exchange for your silence, the NDA doesn't hold weight and it doesn't hold water. So here they talk about giving this severance payment. Number three here, after it talks about the severance payment, in consideration of the above severance payment and consideration, you hereby on behalf of yourself, spouse, agents, heirs, executors, estates, representatives, successors, and assigns irrevocably and unconditionally release and forever discharge Mars Hill of any and all of its members, elders, deacons, managers, directors, administrators, employee benefit plans, officers, affiliates, all of these things, right? All of these things, you release them, okay? You release them from lawsuits. You release them from anything else. So again, this is a release, not just for them, but for their heirs, for their successors, for everybody else. This is a lifelong release. Number five, you'll see that's about confidential information. So let's see what their definition of confidential information is. You and your spouse agree, okay? Now, by the way, this is a standard staple of church NDAs that it tries to hold you and your spouse. The NDA, you're gonna see it here in just a little bit that my wife was given. It was trying to hold me and our kids to it as well. Same thing with Mars Hill. It says you and your spouse here. It talks about your heirs and successors earlier. It's trying to hold your spouse to a document they don't even sign. That's never gonna hold up in court, but that's what they do. They wanna make you not only fearful, but make you fearful that if your spouse, your kids, if anybody ever says anything that could embarrass the church, that you're in trouble. You and your spouse agree at all times to keep in confidence and trust and to not use, divulge, or otherwise disclose for any purpose any confidential information of Mars Hill. Here's the definition. Confidential information means any information pertaining to inventions, improvements, modifications, discoveries, costs, profits, financial information, marketing strategy, promotions, projections, estimates, procedures, donor list, and other related information. Now, all of that is legitimate, and most of it doesn't even apply to the church. Most of that doesn't apply to a church at all, but they put all of the boilerplate stuff in there. But it doesn't just stop there. It continues. It talks about all personal information related to Mars Hill elders, employees, or any other business affairs and methods that Mars Hill and its affiliates used, right? Um, but here's where it gets nasty. And if you're not reading it and you're not reading it closely, you'll miss this. As well as, this is still the definition of confidential, which is massive, okay? We're in but well into like what should be three paragraphs already. Confidential information is as well any other similar information not readily available to the public. So they say it's any information. Any information that's not readily available to the public is confidential, which means 
anything you know that the rest of the church doesn't know that the church hasn't advertised to the congregation is considered confidential. So anything inappropriate, any potential sin, any financial mismanagement, it's all covered there. Anything that the church hasn't announced would be considered confidential information, which basically means that when you get down to brass tacks, you really can't share anything that Mars Hill doesn't want known. So anything that would cause a concern, anything that would cause a whistleblower to come forward is automatically kiboshed and silenced by that definition of confidential. Now, of course, most people aren't gonna read all the way through that because that is mind-numbingly boring and full of legalese. Most people aren't gonna read that. They know that, they bank on that, that you're gonna sign it for severance real, real quick, only to realize later that that confidentiality definition is so broad that you couldn't say anything, you, even if you wanted to, and that some of the things you've already said, even about you leaving, could get you in trouble. They talk about other Christian ways they would like to dispute a resolution, um, but of course, as we've already talked about, most of the time when you try to do that, that's met with deaf ears. And now number seven, here's the big one. Remember, they call this a separation agreement. Here's the big thing, besides the broad definition of confidentiality, Here's the second biggest red flag here that lets you know this is a dirty, a dirty NDA. It's a non-disparagement clause, y'all. The one thing that Boz Savijan talked about, we have talked about this from episode one. This is one of the worst parts of any NDA. And this is the kind of non-disparagement clause that was ruled illegal for businesses, illegal by the National Labor Relations Board. You and your spouse agree that you shall not make any negative or disparaging remarks about Mars Hill or its elders, deacons, officers, employees, managers, ministries, or business practices. And guess what? It doesn't say you can't make negative remarks if they're untrue. You can't make negative remarks even if they're true. And because they don't define it clearly, anything that embarrasses them could be considered negative. That is so subjective that right there, that subjective open-ended non-disparagement clause makes this, it literally strips a person away of all their rights. They can't say anything because if anything's considered negative, they could be taken to court. But again, then at the bottom, it has the employee sign. It has someone witness it, but notice it doesn't have their spouse sign, even though they tell you in the agreement that your spouse would be held to it. Again, a lot of this would not hold up in court because of the broad non-disparagement and because of the spousal piece there. But when people sign it, they get scared and then they stay silent for life and never even check into it. And if they wanted to check into it, they know that big churches like Martill was before it really shut its doors. Big churches like that can outlast them in a legal battle. But let's look at Trinity Church, Mars Hill's new spot, right? And uh, already, as early as 2021, it was reported that they were using non-disclosure agreements. So let's go ahead and pull it up and look at it. It says, the article that I was able to get this from, the alleged non-disclosure agreement. This is the alleged non-disclosure agreement that's used at Trinity Church, okay? The first thing you're going to notice here, this non-disclosure agreement is for volunteers. The title, the Trinity Church Volunteer non-disclosure agreement. Now I'll at least give them points for this. I'll give them points that they actually call it a non-disclosure agreement and don't try to call it something else and uh, just hide what it is. Okay. Now the overview, um, it's all the good stuff because the nature of the work you do as a volunteer, you may have access to confidential information when actually a volunteer shouldn't see people's financial records. A volunteer shouldn't know about counseling information with other pastors. In most cases, there are some cases, but broadly having uh, volunteers do this, this is really overkill, but it says we must protect the church family and guest personal information Trinity volunteers are expected to abide by these confidentiality standards and again to protect um, the church family. This confidentiality is also expected to be carried out by former volunteers. So even if you don't uh, volunteer anymore, it still applies. And any violation of such can result in being asked not to participate in the life of the Trinity church family. If you're a volunteer and you break this NDA, that basically just says we're going to excommunicate you. That is a threat to excommunicate you. But let's look at the definition of confidentiality. Is this specific or is it broad? 
Confidential information includes, but is not limited to, all personal information related to church family, church guests, including contribution history, serving records, contact information, appointments made with pastors, information discussed during meetings, and information in regards to Trinity Church business operations and staffing matters, okay? The first part of this is good. You're not sharing uh, people's contact information, contribution records, serving records, all all of that, right? Um, You're not saying they had appointments for counseling. But when you say you can't share any information discussed during meetings, what if there was something wrong or sinful discussed during a meeting? What if you heard about something discussed in a meeting that needs to be brought to church? You can't say anything about it. But also number two here, information in regards to Trinity Church business operation and staffing matters. There's a lot that may need to be exposed about their business operation and staffing matters. As a matter of fact, most of the things that you would talk about with the church could be tied back to their business operations or staffing matters. So because that information, that definition of confidential at the end is so broad, that makes this fall under the umbrella of one of those toxic NDAs that multiple attorneys in episode one warned us about. And this is a very simple one. It's a very simple, way more simple than the one given to NDAs. But this is how far Mark Driscoll is still going to try to protect any information getting out. And again, you may be okay with the volunteer uh, NDA, but the definition of confidential is way too broad. But you can see the differences. Look at how much deeper and broad and damaging the NDA given to staff goes. They can't say anything. It tries to hold their spouse. It tries to hold everybody. But again, this goes far beyond Mark Driscoll. This is happening in all kinds of churches. I'll actually show you the next one. I'm going to show you the NDA that we were presented with. This is the actual NDA that we were presented with. So I can I mark that up and we're going to walk all the way through it. You're going to notice again at the top, it's not called an NDA. It's called a confidential severance agreement with release and wa- waiver of claims, but a confidential severance agreement, that's just another one of the ways that Boz talked about that these agreements are named. It's still an NDA. In the recital section, you're gonna notice one of the first things it talks about is that the employee and the church desire to enter into this agreement um, mutually, that they, they both wanna do this, it's mutually satisfactory. Yeah, I can tell you, um, my wife had no desire to enter into this agreement. Not at all. I had no desire to enter into this agreement, but they put it in front of her and said things like, you're not going to get any severance if you don't do this. You can't finish out the work with people that you've been doing this to care for people well if you don't sign this. So it wasn't mutual at all, but they have to put that in there because it's supposed to be mutual. We talked about those mutual rights that a bad NDA has non-mutual terms. And right here from the beginning, they're trying to say it's mutual when it wasn't. All right, and at the bottom of the recital section, you're going to see the first mention in this agreement of the special severance payment and special separation benefits. It says that you'll get this special severance payment and separation benefits that he or she would not normally be entitled to in return for his or her execution of this agreement. So uh, let's look at what it doesn't say. It doesn't say that the church is giving you this uh, severance payment to bless you. It doesn't say it's continuing your benefits to bless you. It doesn't say it's a nice thing. It doesn't say that it's doing that to help you land on your feet. It says we're doing this in exchange for you signing this agreement. And at the end of the day, what is this agreement? It's a silencing agreement that you're going to see tells you to stay quiet, stay hushed about everything that you've seen or experienced while at this church. That is not a blessing. That's hush money. And it's right there in black and white for all to see. All right, so section two is all about the money. It's all about the hush money payment, how much money you're going to be paid, how they're going to get it to you, when the payments are going to be made, how the payments are going to be made, and all that sort of stuff is right there. We go through the next session. We'll scroll down to the general release and waiver section where it talks about, again, the employee voluntarily releases and forever discharges the church. It is generally not voluntary. It's in exchange for that severance payment. And note here, all of this language forever discharges the church. And you discharge them from what? From any and all liabilities. You discharge them from your own rights of action, 
from causes of action, suits, charges, claims, complaints, or demands. Whether known or unknown, even if something pops up that you didn't know about, you can't talk about it because you've signed this NDA, asserted or unasserted, which the employee had, has, or may have against the release parties. So basically you are releasing them from literally everything forever. It continues at the bottom. This release also includes, but is not limited to a release by the employee of any claims for wrongful discharge, breach of contract, or other statutory common law tort contract negligence claims that the employee had, has had, or may have against the church, right? This release covers both claims that the employee knows about and those that doesn't. So this part of the agreement is talking about your legal release. You're releasing your legal rights. Even if it's, even if a claim pops up that you didn't know about, you find out more information later, you can't do a thing because of this NDA. Next in number eight, you see the disclaimer of liability. Now here it says that the payments are made solely to assist the employee in making the transition um, from employment at the church, but that is not what the agreement said otherwise. This is a little clause in there to basically absolve them from guilt. And they say this shall not be construed as an admission of liability or responsibility an admission of the truth or any fact. The reason why they have to put that there is because if they don't put that there, the fact that there's an NDA and your severance is tied to an NDA asking for your silence, if they don't put that clause there, it looks like an admission of guilt. So you're gonna see this is a staple in almost all of these that says, hey, we know it looks guilty. We know this looks bad, but uh, we didn't do anything. This is not an admission of guilt which I don't know about you, but generally when I don't have anything I'm guilty of, I don't have to put a clause that tells people I'm not guilty of anything. All right, these next sections are where it gets juicy. Let's go ahead and start looking at the top of the page. It says the employee shall not use, divulge, publish, or disclose to any person or organization confidential information obtained by the employee during the course, uh, course of their employment or related to the employee's cessation of employment. And again, it says in parentheses, confidential information. So what this says is you're not allowed to talk about anything that happened during your employment and you're not allowed to talk about why you left your employment. You gotta give some sort of weird narrative because you're not allowed to talk about it. But we know you can't just say no comment when people ask why you left. But here's their definition of confidential information. And again, let's just ask, is this specific? or is it overly broad like attorneys have warned us about? Confidential information consists of the following. The existence and terms of this agreement itself. The very first thing they consider confidential information is you're not allowed to talk about the fact that this NDA exists. Why? Because if you let people know that churches use NDAs, it automatically makes them look bad. And if we had signed this, I would not be able to talk about the fact that churches use NDAs. The second thing, confidential information includes personal, financial, private, or sensitive information concerning FPC and any other released parties. Again, that's not just personal, financial, and sensitive information that shouldn't be released and is protected for parishioners. It's any kind of financial, sensitive, or personal information. So if you knew that a person who worked at this church had been involved in moral failure, that would be personal and sensitive information. If you knew that there was financial misconduct, you couldn't talk about it, even though it could be sinful or it could be inappropriate use of finances, you can't talk about that either. But it continues. It's confidential information is any information concerning the church's finances, business practices, long-term and strategic plans, and similar matters. So anything that would be considered finances or business practices, they don't want you talking about. And again, that's overly broad. Part D is all good stuff. It's all the stuff that we talked about, the reasons why NDAs were started. The only downside with D is that the church doesn't have trade secrets. The church doesn't have technology secrets, right? So some of D is helpful. Some of D is ridiculous. And then we get to part E. Here's what's considered confidential. Confidential information is any other non-public information, which if used, divulged, published, or disclosed by employee would re be reasonably likely to provide a competitive advantage 
to a competitor or cause the church embarrassment. Let's talk about the first part of this. The first part of this, we've already talked about churches don't have competitors. So let's go ahead and throw that out. That's ridiculous that this church thinks they have competitors and information they need to hide. But let, let's, let's throw that part out and let's look at everything other than the competitive information. Confidential information is any other non-public information which if used, divulged, or published by the employee would cause embarrassment. How open-ended is that? It doesn't say that you can't share information that's true. It doesn't say that you can't, can only share information that's true. It doesn't say that you can't share information that's false. It only says you can't share anything. Confidential means you can't share anything that would embarrass the church. They're not concerned about truth. They're concerned about protecting their reputation. They're concerned about making sure they're not embarrassed, even if it's true things that should embarrass them. Right under that, you do see that if you were to breach this NDA, um, that monetary damages alone will not adequately compensate the church for its losses, you know, because they've been embarrassed and their reputation's taken a hit because the things they're doing. So therefore, it may seek any and all legal or equitable relief available to it, specifically including but not limited to injunctive relief, right? So that's where they're threatening a lawsuit. The bottom part of that section is legitimately just them threatening a lawsuit if you breach the agreement. Section 10, they want to double down on this overly broad definition of confidentiality. And under the confidentiality of agreement section, they say, the employee agrees not to disclose any information concerning the existence or terms of this agreement to anyone other than the employee's attorney, tax advisor, or spouse. And I, I love this again, it says who shall be bound by this confidentiality provision. So if I share this with my spouse, they're supposed to be bound by it. If I share this to a tax advisor, they're supposed to be bound by it. And if I share this to my attorney, they're supposed to be bound by it. So basically you can't share it with anybody but this handful of people. And if you share it with them, they're not now bound for life to this confidentiality agreement. And regardless of whether the things you have to say are true or not, they can't ever talk about it. And they can't even talk about the fact that there is an agreement. Section 11 though, that's the smoking gun. That's the big, broad non-disparagement clause that we've been warned about the whole time. Here's the gag order in all of its glory. Look at section B there non-disparagement employee agrees not to do or say anything directly or indirectly that reasonably may be expected to have the effect of criticizing or disparaging the church or diminishing or impairing the goodwill and reputation of the church they go further to say that the employee agrees not to assert that the church has acted improperly or unlawfully with respect to the employee or any other person regarding employment. It doesn't say that you just can't say this again if it's untrue. You can't say anything that would criticize them, even if it's valid. You can't say anything that would disparage them, even if it's valid. You can't do anything that would hurt their reputation, even if it's valid and it should. You can't even talk about anything if they've acted improperly or unlawfully. You have to shut your mouth about all of it. And then again at the bottom, they're still trying to hold someone to this agreement who doesn't even sign this agreement. This clause also applies to the spouse of the employee. So they've given multiple broad definitions of confidentiality. You've seen the dreaded non-disparagement clause, but if you think that's bad, this is about to get really icky. And again, this isn't just this church. This is something that's in most of these agreements that I've seen today. It talks about attendance at the church. Employee agrees that they cannot attend these two campuses it says they can't attend. One of them's where they worked and one of them's where our family actually worshiped. That we couldn't worship in the same place, that we couldn't worship at the campus where she was on staff. But beyond that, right? Beyond saying you, we, we can't attend church anymore where we've attended church, the employee is invited to attend and it lists the other campuses. But look at this little note that they wrote in there. Apparently that wasn't fixed. Other campuses, no. This whole section keeps anybody from signing it 
from even being able to go to church, to go to small group. They can't talk to the people they've done life with in one of the most trying times of their life. When they're struggling, they can't ask their small group for prayer. They can't do any of that because they're not allowed to attend this church anymore. Section 16 says that if they need you to cooperate in any sort of investigation or testify, that you have to do it. If they ask, you have to do it. And then section 19, recovery in case of breach. This is another threat of lawsuit. Okay. If you say anything you're not supposed to say, they're going to come after you. That's all it is. Another threat of lawsuit. Let's scroll down to section 18 and section 18. It is the intention of the parties that the provisions hereof be binding upon the parties, their employees, affiliates, agents, heirs, successors, and assigns forever. Now that's a bunch of legalese, but it makes it sound like not only for your lifetime, but beyond your lifetime, nobody can ever break this agreement. By the way, have you noticed that throughout this agreement, this church has promised nothing other than a severance payment. They've not said they won't say anything criticizing you. They've not said they won't say anything disparaging about you. They've simply said you can't say anything bad, disparaging, embarrassing about them. And uh, all they have to do is give you money. And that's the thing. You can't say anything, even if it's true. They can say anything they want about you. Then you'll notice in this governing law part, I just, I underlined a couple of these because this boggles my mind. The amount of times that it says you waive and release any private rights voluntarily, this employee waives and releases any private rights. That's the whole reason when you go back and read the judgment, why the National Labor Relations Board made these kind of agreements illegal anyway, was it said it unfairly, it, these kind of agreements unfairly required employees to waive rights that they should always be entitled to. And that's what they're talking about. And finally, here we are at the signature page where you put your name on the dotted line and you sign for just a little bit of severance money and then you're silent for the rest of your life. I hereby release my rights and claims known and unknown in exchange for the special severance payment and separation benefits. So a couple of things to note about this agreement. This particular NDA has had multiple versions of definitions for confidential information. All of them have been overly broad. It also includes a non-disparagement agreement that very clearly says you can't say anything that could be considered embarrassing to the church. Um, and it releases every single time. It's trying to release the person who signs it, their spouse, from saying anything, even if true, that could hurt the church and they can't talk about the agreement itself. So basically everything we talked about that marks a bad NDA is present in this NDA. And this is honestly, this is the kind of NDA that we see most often. Big, long, seven pages, single spaced font, tons of legalese in there and completely shut you down. These are ironclad NDAs. These kind of NDAs would be illegal in the business world, but these are the kinds that churches are choosing to use week in and week out. And the last uh, NDA that we're going to look at before we look at one of the confidentiality uh, clauses in an employee handbook is going to be from Elevation Church. This is both for staff and volunteers. You see at the very beginning, at the top, they call it a confidentiality agreement, not an NDA, but we know hearing from attorneys in episode one that that is just another uh, name for an NDA. All right, so in section one on confidentiality, when you look at the definition of confidentiality here, at first glance, it looks like Elevation's doing a really good job. This is more specific than any of the other church agreements that I've seen. Um, it lays out a lot of the good reasons for confidentiality um, that we talked about, you know, contact list, contact information, uh, donor information, all that sort of stuff. And it seems pretty good. It's not perfect, but it seems pretty good. But when you look at the very beginning of the definition, this is where you notice the problem and it's just snuck in there. It's so easy not to notice. I didn't even notice it the first couple of times that I read the agreement, but it says the term confidential information means all non-public information. All non-public information. Basically, any information you get volunteering at this church or working at this church, if the public doesn't know it, if they haven't announced it to the public, then it's considered confidential. So even though the rest of this definition seems to have some scope, this very first line, the first half of this sentence, 
The term confidential information means all non-public information. That's how broad it gets. If they haven't announced it to the public, you're in trouble if you talk about it. And guys, that is so easy to miss. It's so easy when you're looking at an agreement like this, when you're excited about serving, you're excited about starting this job at this really big church, you're excited about the ministry that you could do. Most people are never going to notice that. Yet when they need to keep you quiet, they can bring your attention to, hey, any information that we haven't disclosed to the public, you can't share and you won't be able to share it at all. We scroll down, a lot of the other stuff is really just legal boilerplate, but you scroll down to section three and you see that in 3.1, that's where they, they talk about what they can do if you breach the agreement. That's where they threaten that they can uh, take legal action. They can come after you in any way they deem necessary if you breach the agreement. Now, I will say overall, this elevation agreement is not as bad as some of the others, but that first line leaves open for confidential information to be incredibly broad, and they could still use that to muzzle you completely. It's very easy to look over. So when you see NDAs like this, we have to be really careful because we may think we're signing an NDA that's pretty good. You got to make sure there's not a single line in that NDA that gives an over broad definition of confidentiality. Um, but I will give elevation props there. They didn't include the dreaded non-disparagement clause. They're the only church we've looked at so far that hasn't had the non-disparagement clause. And I would say that nine out of every 10 NDAs that I see from churches have the overly broad non-disparagement clause. So good on you, Elevation Church, for not using that one. Again, I don't know if they use NDAs um, at the end of employment, but the only NDA that we could find from them is the one that's used at the beginning of employment. We at least wanted to let you look at it. And now the last thing that we're going to look at, I want to show you how some churches have started using the employee handbook that you have to sign when you start employment to sneak in confidentiality clauses, to sneak in non-disparagement clauses and NDAs that will help bind you. So again, if you get terminated or you get pushed out of the church, you get excommunicated, they'll give you another one that is much more legally put together, but they tell you, hey, this is basically signing the same thing as you signed in your employee handbook. A lot of times people are shocked to find out that they signed a confidentiality agreement in an employee handbook like this because the employee handbook may be 60 to 100 pages long, but again, they just tuck it in there. And if you're not careful, they'll sneak it in there and you'll never know that you signed it in the first place. So here is an example. This is an employee handbook from a church went ahead and marked out all that information so we're not showing which church this is because we have been asked not to show which church this is by the anonymous source that gave it to us. But right here, you see the section on confidential information. And it says this, the protection of confidential information is vital to the interests and successes of this church. Confidential information is all information disclosed to or known by you because of employment that is not generally known to people outside the church about its business. So right here in the employee handbook is the most overly broad definition of confidential that you could have. And it goes back to the same problem we had with, in, with uh, the Elevation NDA just a moment ago. Confidential information is anything that the public doesn't know. It's not generally known to people outside of the church. But if you scroll down just a little bit, this bottom section clarifies even further what they're talking about, and it paints you in even more of a corner. The sharing of personal information or sensitive information that would harm others or the progress of this church must be kept private. It doesn't say again that it has to be untrue information, but if you share anything that would harm their progress. Now they talk about good things, counseling conversations, negotiations. That's really good. They talk about financial information, which again, sometimes financial information, you need to be a whistleblower on that when inappropriate or illegal things are happening. Same thing with internal activities. Sometimes you need to be able to blow the whistle on that, but they say, Hey, even if there's something wrong going on, you can't say anything. Now, if you scroll down even further later on in the agreement, there's another confidentiality clause. It says respect confidentiality 
you must not disclose any information that is confidential or proprietary to the church. What information is proprietary to a church? It continues, though, consult your supervisor or a member of the executive team to review the church's confidentiality policies for guidance on what constitutes confidential or proprietary information. So basically, they say you, you can't disclose anything that's proprietary or confidential, but you don't know if it's confidential until you've asked somebody if you can share it first. So if you do share something they don't like, they can say, hey, you should have asked us first and you didn't. So again, that is overly broad, but this last part is the most important. This is the most damaging part that I've seen in this employee handbook. And we see stuff like this a lot. Be sure that what you are announcing has been on the weekend communication card or the website or announced by the church before posting it or sharing it. Again, if the church hasn't announced it, then it's considered confidential, which means anything the church doesn't want to get out, even if it's sinful, even if it's illegal, even if it needs to get out, they're telling you that you can't share it. And this is just tucked in to the social media policy in this handbook. And then finally, as we get toward the end of this employee handbook, there's yet another mention of confidentiality. In this section, it talks about reasons why you could be disciplined or you could be terminated. They've thrown another piece of this in here. You can't talk about any information that could hurt their reputation. And then divulging number eight, you can get in trouble for divulging confidential church information to unauthorized people. And again, what is confidential church information? It's any information they haven't announced to the public. That is multiple, multiple confidentiality clauses in the same employee handbook Again, usually these are 60 to 100 pages. I think this one was around 50 to 55, 60 pages. Um, but the employee handbook that you get on day one, you know, most people don't read that entire employee handbook. Yet when you sign it, when you sign it, you're signing a form of a confidentiality agreement. Now, there's still a reason why most of these churches use severances because the employee handbook is not as legally enforceable. But remember what Albert Tate talked about. Albert Tate said, hey, when they sign these NDAs, they're just, they're just reinforcing what they signed in their employee handbook. This is the kind of thing that they're talking about. You're muzzled on both ends from talking about things. You're kept from talking about things that are wrong, that are sinful, that are inappropriate. You can't talk about them even if they are wrong because they're considered confidential with these overly broad definitions. So you've seen multiple NDAs, you've seen confidentiality clauses in an employee handbook, and nothing that we've shown today is something that's inconsistent with what we see out of churches. These have become, as Albert Tate and others have said across this docu-series, normal and standard practices in the evangelical church world. And guys, it has to stop. These practices, these NDAs, these clauses, they look nothing like Jesus. And I hope that you've learned something, if nothing else, if you're working at a church for any reason, volunteering at a church for any reason, if they ask you to sign something, please be careful. Please look at it in depth. And if possible, have an attorney look at it. Because as you can see, they slip all kinds of crazy clauses, confidentiality clauses, non-disparagement clauses, they'll just slip them in in places where you won't see what you're signing. And before you know it, you've signed something that will keep you silent for life, even about things that need to be talked about, even about darkness and sin that needs to be exposed and needs to be remedied. Because when we sign things like this, there's no way that we can protect people that God has called us to protect. There's no way that we can love people that God has called us to love. All right, so as we finish out this docu-series, I wanna leave you with some encouragements and some challenges. Because as we've talked about when we started this episode today, it's gonna to take all of us. We've got to stand together. We need as many people as possible to stand together, to stand up for people, to stand up for truth, and to stand against these toxic and sinful silencing practices in the church. We need as many people as possible to stand against the use of NDAs in churches if we want to see the church grow and we want to see the church get better. If we want to see people protected, we've got to stand against these practices even when it's uncomfortable. So the first word of encouragement I want to give is a, a proactive challenge and encouragement to church staff members. If you're on staff at a church 
Have you ever asked your church and your leaders if they use NDAs, confidentiality agreements, severance agreements? And if you haven't, please ask. And in the future, as you look for employment at new churches, make that a part of the interview process. Ask them up front, because if we don't ask, we'll never know. Now, the problem is a lot of churches are still not going to be honest with us. They're going to give us the anti accountability dance. They're going to give us a lot of lip service like Albert Tate and others have. But because you've watched this series, you know some of the things to look for. If, if they use severance agreements, if they use non-disparagement clauses, those are still NDAs. But if you're at a place where you can, if you're in a place where you have the influence and authority to do so, it's best when our churches actually allow third-party mediators or third-party professionals to witness onboarding and termination processes, onboarding and termination conversations. Because when you have a third party uh, who is present at the onboarding of new employees and who is present at the termination of employees, they can ensure and be able to let people know that either NDAs were used or NDAs weren't. They can sign off on that. So if you're in church leadership at all and you want to make sure your church is above reproach, being able to have a third party mediator or third party professional who can sign off and disclose to your church that, you know, for that calendar year, NDAs were not used, that could be super helpful. But if you're on a church staff and you find out the NDAs are used, okay? Please, I know this is uncomfortable, but would you be courageous enough to demand the immediate end to this practice? Would you petition your leaders in the unhonoring way, but would you petition your leaders to immediately release all people from NDAs who sign them? If you're on church staff and you find out your church has used NDAs, that's two things that I'm asking you to do, even though it's scary. Demand the end of NDA use immediately and the request, the petition, that all former NDA signers are released from them, released from the non-disparagement portions of them. And hey, if your leaders respond well and they stop using NDAs or they tailor their NDAs so that they're specific and helpful, that is great. That's fantastic. But if they don't, would you please report it? And you can do this anonymously. We're not going to throw you under the bus. But if your church leaders, you find out they're using NDAs and they won't stop, could you report that to us? And if you have a copy of the NDAs, you have a copy of the confidentiality agreements, we would love to see those. Again, if you request that they be, uh, remain anonymous, we're going to keep them anonymous like we have with so many. Um, anytime we're asked about that, that's why we don't share them in situations like this. But the more NDAs that we get our hands on, the more information that we can gather, the more it helps us as we combat this in churches and it helps us to combat this in a healthy and helpful way. But please, I am begging you, don't overlook this. If you find out your church is using NDAs, don't overlook this. Don't allow this dangerous, toxic, and in ways criminal practice to continue in the church. You can be a part of justice and loving people, or you can be complicit in continued abuse and misconduct. But guys, the truth is there's no middle ground. Either we are for justice, mercy, and love, or we're complicit in abuse and the mistreatment of people. And anytime we allow NDAs to be used in our church, anytime we know they're used and we allow it and we don't walk away, we become complicit in the things that it's causing, abuse, the mistreatment of people, and all kinds of other things. And if you're on staff at a church that tries to get you to sign an NDA, that may be years in the future from now when you find out. If you have an NDA put in front of you, I want to ask you to think long and hard before you sign it. Because I know if that gets put in front of you, you need that money. And I know how tempting it's going to be to sign it. But the truth is, the money fades really quickly. But the regret, the regret's something that stays with you for a lifetime. And if you find yourself in this situation, we completely understand the fear, the anxiety, the trepidation that comes from it. We have been there. So if you find yourself as a church staff member who's presented with an NDA, would you reach out to us? Just visit disrupted.church, click on the contact form, and if you would use the subject line NDA, if you will reach out to us, we want to support you and we want to help you in any way that we can. We can't make any promises, but we will do our best to help you find financial support and to help you cover that severance without having to sign an NDA and without having to sign away your rights. Now to church leaders, that's senior pastors, that's executive 
church leaders. That's elder boards. If you are in church leadership, you're a decision maker in any way. If you don't use NDAs, thank you. Thank you so much for setting such a good example. But if you do use NDAs, all I would ask is that you please stop. Please stop immediately. Don't let any grass grow under your feet. Please stop using these NDAs immediately. And I'm also going to ask you this, as scary as it might be, will you publicly release everyone who is bound by a previous NDA? We need to fight for transparency. We need to fight for accountability. And if you don't have anything to hide, there is nothing to fear. If you do have something to hide, I can promise you this. Eventually, it will come out. NDA or not, eventually, it will come out. Why not get in front of it, choose transparency, choose accountability, and through humility and repentance, you might find that there's way more forgiveness available to you than you thought. But if you are a decision maker, pastor, elder board, doesn't matter, please, if your church uses NDAs, stop immediately and release everyone who's already bound by one. I think it's pretty clear that's what Jesus would do. I think it's pretty clear that's what would honor Christ most. So that's what we need to do. And finally, my last encouragement is to church members. Um, if you're just an everyday church member, a lot of times you could, you could probably go through your whole life and not find out anything about NDAs, but we owe it to the kingdom. We owe it to staff members. We owe it to victims of abuse to make sure that our church doesn't use NDAs. So if you don't know your church's stance on NDAs, ask, ask. And um, in this video, I'm going to play you a real quick clip from Rachel Denhollander. Remember, Rachel is an attorney that we heard from in episode two. She actually gives you some tips on some things that you can do as a church member to find out if your church uses NDAs and to try to make a difference if your church does use NDAs. So for all church members, I want you to hear this encouragement from Rachel Denhollander, and then we'll finish up with a couple of more words for you. Everybody can go back to their churches and their ministries and say, hey, what's our policy on NDAs? What is your attorney advising you? Uh, and how are you handling these things? What NDAs do we have in place? Especially if you're a, like on a board of trustees, go find out what NDAs are in place for your organization. You have a right to know. Uh, find out how they're being used. Find out what the policy is. Find out what your general counsel is telling you to do with NDAs, because if you have a general counsel that's pushing you towards NDAs, uh, they might be giving you the commonplace legal advice, but as a Christian organization, they're not giving you the, but what does the Bible say advice? What's our moral and ethical code going to be? Uh, and they simply may not be as skilled as you think they are navigating the differences between what you have to protect legally, your, you know, your donor lists and your trademarks and your patents, between navigating and protecting those things and how an NDA is actually used. They're not the mm -hmm. same thing. Um, and mm -hmm. so again, that question of what can a bystander do, that's a really tangible thing that you as a bystander can do. Go find out what your church and the ministries you're involved in are doing with NDAs. All right, so great advice from Rachel Denhollander there. Um, and in a nutshell, just ask, because if nothing else, starting these conversations in our churches is extremely healthy. But another thing that you can do, especially if you're not sure if church leaders are being honest with you, and I hate to say that, but we know that oftentimes uh, when it comes to this issue, church leaders are not honest. Talk to former staff members at your church and talk to staff that are leaving. If as you're talking to them about the reasons why they left or the reasons they're leaving, if it seems like they're constantly holding something back or they're giving you some sort of spun story, then that's a red flag that they're likely bound by an NDA. And they're having to figure out how to tell a story in a way that's going to make you stop asking questions but still makes the church look good, okay? Um, when you ask a normal person why they left, they're gonna give you both the good, bad, and the ugly. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's also not gonna be spun. So if you feel like every person that you ask you're getting a spun and sanitized story, it's a good, there's a good chance that they've signed NDAs that say they can't talk about the NDA, which forces them to lie to you about it. Now, if you do find out, for any reason that your church uses NDAs, I want to encourage you to go through the proper governance channels um, and just make a request that they stop using those NDAs immediately and that they release parties already bound to them. Same things that we talked about. So that could be your elder board. That could be the denomination. That could be another pastor. Whatever it looks like in your church governance structure, if you find out they're using NDAs, simply make the request that the practice stop. 
And if they don't agree to do so, I'm going to be honest. If they don't agree to do so, that pastor, that elder board, that church leadership should be removed. If they do agree to, awesome. But if they don't, it's time that they be removed. I know that is harsh, but if we have churches using NDAs, the leaders know it and they refuse to fix it, we've got a bigger problem. If they won't stop using the NDAs though, a lot of times you're not going to be able to remove them. So if you go through the proper channels, they refuse to stop using these NDAs. They refuse to release people from them. That's a good indication. It's time for you to leave because again, staying in and supporting these churches, that's the same as supporting NDAs and supporting the abuse that they cover up. And the truth is when these church leaders feel the hit of attendance and they feel the hit of finances, that's when they're going to stop. But as long as the money is flowing and people are coming and attending the church, they're going to keep doing the same toxic things until they feel it. They're not going to change. So as much as it hurts, if you find out your church is using NDAs and they refuse to change, the best thing you can do is leave that church until something changes. Because if you don't, probably nothing's ever going to change. I hope this docuseries has helped you to better understand both the impact and the danger of NDA use in the church. And I hope it's inspired you to stand with me, to stand with us, to stand with organizations like NDA Free, to take a stand against NDAs and to try to fight for a better church tomorrow. Because when we do, I think that pleases the heart of God. So whether you're a church leader, whether you are a parishioner, whether you can make these calls or you can't, let's all take one step toward ending the use of NDAs in churches. And as far as it depends on us, as much as we can with as much influence as we have, let's fight for a church that exposes darkness, that lives in the light, that fights for truth, and that beyond all else, loves and protects people. Because when we love and protect people and we tell the truth, that's when we look most like Jesus. 